the Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. The committee is meeting today to receive testimony on cyber threats in the pipeline using lessons from the colonial ransomware attack to defend critical infrastructure. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. The general lady from New Jersey, Ms. Watson Coleman, shall assume the duties of the chair should I have technical difficulties. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Last month, malicious hackers infiltrated Colonial Pipeline's network and infected its IT systems with ransomware. For nearly a week, 5,500 miles of pipeline supplying 45% of the fuel on the East Coast was shut down and panic buying resulted in fuel shortages in the Southeast. Since pipeline service was restored, we've learned more about what happened. We know hackers exploited an unprotected VPN account that was no longer in use to gain access to Colonial Pipeline's network. We know Colonial Pipeline paid the ransom demand and the FBI has since recovered most of it. And we know Colonial Pipeline is hardly alone. This spring, ransomware attacks hit the world's largest meat processor, transportation systems in New York City and Martha's Vineyard and Scripps Health in San Diego. But the potential impact of a long-term shutdown of the country's biggest pipeline crystallized the devastating consequences of ransomware. More importantly, it raised serious questions about the cybersecurity practices of critical infrastructure owners and operators and whether voluntary cybersecurity standards are sufficient to defend ourselves against today's cyber threats. I was glad to see the Transportation Security Administration issue a security directive to mandate some security requirements for the pipeline industry, but more requirements may still be needed. To drive the policies necessary to defend against and mitigate the impacts of future ransomware attacks, we need a complete understanding of the circumstances surrounding the ransomware attack against Colonial and the decisions it made during the incident response. Today, our goal is to examine the cybersecurity practices in place at Colonial prior to the May 2021 ransomware attack and assess whether other critical infrastructure operators might be similarly situated and vulnerable. We need to understand the degree to which Colonial utilized the full range of security resources made available by TSA. Colonial Sector Risk Management Agency and Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency. I'm troubled by reports that Colonial declined repeated offers by TSA over the past year to assess its security defenses. We also need to understand whether Colonial had a ransomware incident response and continually of operation plan, continuity of operation plan, and whether it had been practiced and tested. Government officials and cybersecurity experts have been warning about the growing threat of ransomware for years. We need to know how private sector entities like Colonial acted on these warnings. I'm concerned that too few have robust cyber incident response and continuity of operation plans in place. Finally, we need to understand the threat actor, how it targets victim, what tools it utilizes to infiltrate networks, and how we can deter this kind of behavior. Before I close, I'd like to commend the FBI for its working work recovering Colonial's ransomware payment and depriving the hackers of the financial benefit of their malicious cyber activity. <clears throat> I hope the FBI success serves 
as an incentive for future ransomware victims to engage with law enforcement early. And I hope Colonial will use the recoup money to make necessary improvements in its cybersecurity. I look forward to a productive discussion, and I thank the witnesses for being here today. With that, I recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, thank you for calling this most timely and important hearing today. And I thank you for your continued partnership and the joint effort to increase American cybersecurity resilience. From data integrity on federal systems to pipelines to meat processing to key transportation assets, the connected systems that underpin our way of life are constantly under attack by cyber adversaries. It's been getting worse and it must stop. This isn't hypothetical or the plot of a Hollywood film. These attacks on our critical infrastructure are happening right in front of our eyes. The next steps we take are of vital importance. They should be a mix of short-term tactical and longer-term foundational policy shifts. The next step, the, uh, the government will need to take the lead in certain areas. For other responsibilities, the onus will be on industries. Throughout all of this, however, we must work together foundational to the work of this committee must be maximizing the role of CISA. We must mature the relationship between CISA and the nation's lead civilian cybersecurity agency with centralized capacity and tools and the sector risk management agencies who have the sector specific relationships and expertise. Optimizing, not eroding these relationships between CISA and the various SRMAs will be critical going forward. Now is the time, not, now is not the time to relitigate previous turf battles. I am hopeful that the recent TSA security directive is an important first step forward in strengthening both TSA and CISA's ability to respond to these rapidly evolving cyber threats. <clears throat> Although there's a valid question of why it took so long for TSA to finally leverage this authority. <clears throat> it's vital that TSA be relentless in its focus going forward to secure the nation's 2.7 million miles of pipelines. TSA needs to continue to involve industry in the implementation of this security directive and future ones. As we continue to provide clarity and confidence in federal roles and responsibilities, we also must keep on the full court press to provide CISA with the resources it needs to help the critical infrastructure community. I recently introduced HR 1833, the DHS Industrial Control Systems Capabilities Enhancement Act of 2021, a bill with bipartisan support that is designed to protect critical infrastructure from cyber attacks and further bolster the deployable and scalable pool of resources CISA offers to assess to assist stakeholders. I am pleased that this bill passed out of committee unanimously and I'm hopeful for its prompt consideration on the floor of the House. Make no mistake about it. The federal government has some significant execution challenges on the horizon where it cannot afford to fumble. I recently worked with the chairman to sound the alarm on the implementation timeline of continuity of the economy planning as mandated by last year's NDAA. This is a provision we supported that was designed exactly for moments like this. Where is it? We need it now and we need it the most. Following a devastating solar winds attack in December of 2020, I created a five pillar plan to enhance American cybersecurity. I'm encouraged to see that the software heavy provisions of the administration's new cyber executive order track very closely to my suggestions. But again, we must hold the administration's feet to the fire to ensure the aggressive but necessary deadlines are met. The federal government also faces a moment of reckoning when it comes to deterrence. While many of the recent hacks have come from so called apolitical organizations, Certain countries, in particular Russia, are creating safe havens for these bad actors. The president is a meeting with Putin next week. I hope to see the president send a clear message that turning a blind eye to cyber criminals who attacked our critical infrastructure is completely unacceptable. He must make it abundantly clear what the continued harboring of these groups will mean. Ultimately, strength only respects strength, and that's what we need to project now. As we learn from incidents from like the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, I do believe the private sector also must look hard in the mirror. While I don't think a culture of blaming the victim is ultimately constructive, clearly, and I mean clearly, we could all do better 
to protect our critical infrastructure networks. I appreciate Colonial Pipeline's identification of places where they are now hardening systems in response to the devastating ransomware attack in May. But this begs an obvious question. If your pipeline provides fuel to 45% of the East Coast, why are you only hardening your systems after an attack has occurred? Why wasn't it done beforehand? Again, I'm not interested in blaming the victim here, but we must all learn from these incidents to prevent future destruction. As we, as we painfully witnessed a string of even more ransomware attacks since Colonial, it's clear to all of us that we must break the ransomware business model once and for all. We cannot accept default to accepting extortion. As an industry leader, there is certainly heavy pressure to get your own systems up and running when facing a frightening cyber attack. But the easy fix of today only funds the ransomware attacks of tomorrow. Everything should be on the table here with know your customer and cryptocurrency reporting requirements being the low hanging fruit. While it is encouraging that the FBI was able to recover the majority of the Bitcoin ransom in this, in this instant, and I, along with the chairman, applaud them for that. We can't rest on the capability of this, uh, this happening going forward. Finally, this string of devastating cyber incidents with real world impacts has reinforced that we need a codified process of identifying systematically important critical infrastructure. I look forward to working with a wide range of stakeholders to get this right. I anticipate that much of today's hearing will highlight just how much time is of the essence. I hearten, I'm heartened to see that tomorrow, the Senate will hold confirmation hearings for the CISA and national cyber directors. Let's keep our foot on the gas pedal. Let's work together. There is no other option. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Other members of the committee are reminded that under committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Members are also reminded that the committee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in our February 3rd colloquy regarding remote procedures. I welcome our witnesses. Our first witness, Mr. Joseph Blunt, is the president and CEO of Colonial Pipeline. Mr. Blunt joined Colonial in 2017 with more than three decades of experience in the energy industry. Our second witness, Mr. Charles Carmichael, is Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at FireEye Management. In that role, he oversees a team of security professionals that assist organizations in responding to security breaches by foreign governments and organized criminals. Without objection, the witnesses' full statements will be inserted in the record. I now ask Mr. Blunt to summarize his statement for five minutes. Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, and members of the committee, my name is Joe Blount, and since 2017, I have served as President and CEO of the Colonial Pipeline Company. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. Since 1962, we have been shipping and transporting refined products to market. Our pipeline system spans over 5,500 miles, is one of the most complex pieces of energy infrastructure in America, if not the world. On any given day, we transport more than 100 million gallons of gasoline, diesels, jet fuel, and other refined products. Shipping that product safely and securely is what we do. The product we transport accounts for nearly half of the fuel consumed on the East Coast providing energy for more than 50 million Americans. Americans rely on us to get the fuel to the pump, but so do cities and local governments. We supply fuel for critical operations such as airports, ambulances, and first responders. The safety and security of our pipeline system is something we take very seriously, and we always operate with the interests of our customers, shippers, and the country first in mind. Just one month ago, we were the victims of a ransomware attack by a cyber criminal group, and that attack encrypted our IT systems. Although the investigation is still ongoing, we believe the attacker exploited the legacy VPN profile that was not intended to be in use. DarkSide demanded a financial payment in exchange for a key to unlock the impacted systems. 
We had cyber defenses in place, but the unfortunate reality is those defenses were compromised. This attack forced us to make difficult decisions, choices in real time that no company ever wants to face. But I am proud of the way our people reacted quickly to isolate and contain the attack so we could get the pipeline back up and running safely. I am also very grateful for the immediate and sustained support of law enforcement, CISA, and other federal authorities, including the White House. We reached out to federal authorities within hours of the attack, and they have continued to be true allies as we worked so quickly and safely to restore our operations. I especially want to thank the Department of Justice and the FBI for their leadership and the progress they announced in this matter earlier this week. I also want to express my gratitude to the employees of Colonial Pipeline and the American people for your actions and support as we responded to the attack and dealt with the disruption that it caused. We are deeply sorry for the impact that this attack had, but we are also heartened by the resilience of our country and of our company. Finally, I wanna address two additional issues that I know are on your minds, and I'm going to address them in the only way I know how to, directly and honestly. First, the ransom payment. I made the decision to pay, and I made the decision to keep the information about the payment as confidential as possible. It was the hardest decision I've ever made in my 39 years in the energy industry. I know how critical our pipeline is to the country, and I put the interests of the country first. I kept the information closely held because we were concerned about operational security, and we wanted to stay focused on getting the pipeline back up and running. I believe with all my heart that it was the right choice to make. I also want to now state publicly that we quietly and quickly worked with law enforcement in this matter from the start, which may have helped lead to the substantial recovery of funds announced by the DOJ this week. Second, we are further hardening our cyber defenses. We have rebuilt and restored our critical IT systems and are continuing to enhance our safeguards but we are not yet where I want us to be. If our CIO needs resources, she will get them. We also have brought in several of the world's leading experts to help us fully understand what happened and how we can continue in partnership with you to add defenses and resiliency to our networks. I especially want to thank Mandiant, Dragos, and Black Hills on the consultant side in the White House and all the government agencies who assisted us both with the criminal investigation and with the restart of the pipeline. We are already working to implement the recent guidance and directives on cybersecurity. Our forensic work continues and we will learn more in the months ahead. I appreciate your support and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you very much. I now ask Mr. Carmichael to summarize his statement for five minutes. Thank you for this opportunity to share our observations and experiences regarding this important topic, as well as for your leadership on cybersecurity issues. My name is Charles Carmichael, and I'm a senior vice president and CTO at FireEye Mandiant. We commend the committee for holding this hearing to further examine the recent ransomware attack against Colonial Pipeline. Both governmental and corporate responses to this attack continue to evolve, and the committee plays an important role in overseeing these efforts. As requested, I'm gonna share our observations of the threat actor associated with the ransomware attack against Colonial Pipeline, to discuss cybersecurity threats to organizations in the United States. In my role at Mandiant, I oversee a team of incident responders that help organizations respond to complex cybersecurity incidents. My team and I have had the opportunity to help organizations across the globe deal with some of the most significant cybersecurity incidents in history. Mandiant is on the front lines of the cyber battle, actively responding to con computer intrusions at some of the largest organizations on a global scale. We employ over a thousand cybersecurity experts in over 25 countries with skills in digital forensics, malware analysis, intelligence collections, threat actor attribution, and security strategy and transformation. Over the last 17 years, we've responded to tens of thousands of security incidents. It's unfortunate, but unfortunately every day we get calls from organizations that are dealing with the cybersecurity breach. On the early morning of May 7th, 2021, Mandiant was engaged to help Colonial Pipeline respond to the ransomware incident earlier that day. 
Prior to that date, Mandate had not provided cybersecurity consulting services to Colonial Pipeline. Shortly after being called by Colonial Pipeline in the morning, we mobilized a team of experienced incident responders to help Colonial Pipeline investigate and contain the incident, eradicate the threat actor, and further enhance the security posture of the network to facilitate a safe restart to the pipeline. Additionally, Mandiant is advising Colonial Pipeline on ways to become more resilient to cyber attacks. Cyber intrusions have become more increasingly disruptive over the past decade. Every year, Mandiant publishes an annual security report where we summarize the trends that we've observed in the past year. In 2015, Mandiant observed a notable surge in disruptive intrusions in which threat actors deliberately destroy data, leak confidential data, taunt business executives, and extort victim organizations. We anticipated that these intrusions would become more disruptive over time, given the high impact to victim organizations and the low cost to threat actors. In late 2019, a hacking group by the name of Maze changed the way that threat actors would conduct their intrusions. Prior to deploying ransomware, they would steal data from victim organizations in a way to conduct multifaceted extortion. They launched a website in which they would shame victim organizations by um, amplifying the message that they'd hacked into those organizations and published tranches of data um, from those victim organizations. Last October, the threat to, cyber, to, to the United States had reached an unprecedented level. Hospitals across the United States dealt with an acute threat from Eastern European criminals that wanted to deliberately disrupt operations in hospitals. Hospital technology systems were taken offline and medical professionals and administrative staff had to rely on paper-based um, mechanisms to document uh, procedures and, um, and uh, uh, medicine. The impact to cyber intrusions to human lives had never been more dire. The majority of today's intrusions by financially motivated threat actors involve multifaceted extortion. Threat actors will apply immense pressure to coerce victims to pay substantial extortion demands, often in the seven to eight figure range. Some threat actors will convince news and media organizations to write embarrassing stories about the victims. They may call or harass employees, and they may also conduct an all of service attacks against those organizations. I wanna spend a moment talking about the dark side threat group. DarkSide is a ransomware service that enables a network of different groups to conduct cyber intrusions under the name DarkSide. Like many financially motivated threat actors, the criminals affiliated with the DarkSide service conduct multifaceted extortion schemes to coerce victims into paying large extortion demands. They exfiltrate victim data, deploy DarkSide ransomware encryptors, and threaten to publish the stolen data to victim shaming sites. They've launched a global crime spree affecting organizations in more than 15 countries and multiple industry verticals since initially surfacing in August 2020. Following the security incident at Colonial Pipeline and the FBI's public attribution to DarkSide, the group claimed to have lost access to the infrastructure, including their blog, payment and content distribution network servers, and they said they would be closing down their service. Operational technology and industrial control systems are responsible for managing and monitoring the industrial equipment, machines, and processes across the world. They facilitate the generation and distribution of power, operations of manufacturing plants, and transportation of people and products. To mitigate the risks associated with OT environments, organizations often segment their IT environments from their OT environments. There have been relatively fewer publicly disclosed intrusions of OT environments, but certainly the impact is incredible. On behalf of Mandiant, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee. We stand ready to work with you to devise effective solutions to deter malicious behavior in cyberspace and to build better resiliency into our networks. I thank the witnesses for their testimony. I will remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the witnesses. I now recognize myself for questions. Uh, Mr. Mr. Blount, uh, I want to clarify the timeline of certain events following the ransomware uh, attack. Would you please walk the committee through the 24 hours or so after Colonial learned of the attack? And in that, would you include the approximate time you reached out to Mandian? When you reached out to and met with various offices with the FBI? When you reached out to and met with CISA? when you reached out to the Department of Energy, when you reached out to TSA, 
and exactly when did you pay the ransom? Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to, to answer your questions. I, I, I may have to ask you uh, to repeat a few of them along the way, but let me let me start with what, what I gathered here. Uh, the, the attack, the ransom note showed up on a system in our control room at approximately around 5 a.m. on May the 7th. Uh, the uh, controller that saw the ransomware note immediately took it to a supervisor and they consulted quickly with our IT group. The decision was made uh, right before 6 a.m. as a result of that threat in order to contain that threat to shut down the pipeline system and, and, and all the IT associated with that. Shortly thereafter, within an hour or so, uh, and I'll be glad to get the exact time for you because I don't have it, uh, we contacted Mandiant to come in and, and determine exactly what we had and to start the investigative process and, and obviously to start the restoration process. Um, so that's that's the conversation there. Uh, shortly thereafter, and still early in the morning, we contacted the local office, the Atlanta office of the FBI. We have a relationship there. Uh, told them what we had seen on our computer systems and our concern regarding that. And the agent in charge there agreed that we needed more conversation. And they volunteered that they would call CISA and bring them into the conversation. Uh, which the FBI scheduled for slightly after 12 noon of that day. While all that was going on, we had various employees uh, responsible for making contact to any number of other governmental entities. So again, I can give you a more detailed timeline, but I will tell you over the course of that day in the early morning hours following, we contacted the White House, we contacted the National Security Council, we contacted DOE, we contacted FEMSA, we contacted FERC, we contacted DHS, and we contacted EIA. In addition to that, to help to start um, sharing what we knew with our industry counterparts, we also contacted the API and the AOPL as well, of which we are members, in order to make sure they were aware of what was going on and if they had any opportunity to keep a closer eye on their systems in case there was a similar threat attack to them as a result of that. Uh, thank you. Um, we will send uh, the specific request uh, on the timeline uh, following, but I appreciate uh, what you've done. Um, what time and what day did you pay the ransom? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we had a discussion about the ransom in the late late afternoon of May 7th, uh, consulting with uh, legal outside legal representatives who've been involved in cyber attacks in the past. And we made the decision that afternoon to proceed forward with negotiations uh, with the criminal uh, on the possibility of paying the ransom. The actual payment of the ransom was not made until sometime on Saturday. And again, if, if you need that exact time, I can get that for you, sir, but I don't have that here. Well, it would be helpful. The other thing, did did you talk to the FBI or any other government official about paying the ransom? Additional discussions with the FBI or any other governmental agency regarding the ransom. I did not get part of your question, your answer. My, my apologies, Mr. Chairman. We did not have any discussion with the FBI or any other governmental entity about the actual negotiation or the payment of the ransom at that time. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I understand you have received about $2.3 million. Uh, and in my opening statements, I talked about uh, are you committed to investing some, if not all of that money toward hardening your systems so that something like this uh, might not happen again? Mr. Chairman, I, I'm glad you asked me that question. And, you know, go back to what I heard from Ranking Member Katko as well. We're always in the process of hardening our systems and making investments in IT and cyber security at Colonial. So to your request today of putting an additional $2.2 .2 million in, into uh, hardening our systems further is not a difficult one to, to address and agree to. 
Uh, in my opening statement, I already explained that we not only, in addition to Mandiant, have also brought in Dragos to take a very close look at our OT system and further strengthen whatever needs to be done there. They're a world-known expert in that, as well as to bring in uh, Black Hills to also look at the entire process. We are making a substantial investment, and part of the reason for that is we have been compromised. We've had criminals within our system now, and we need to change a lot of things that we already had because they would be familiar with them from having been in the system uh, over the course of those days. Thank you very much. Mr. Carmichael, um, uh, just two quick questions. Uh, would an open VPN system uh, with a normal uh, security uh, or IT security system have been picked up? Yeah, so let me, let me just uh, provide a little bit of context into what is now believed to be the earliest evidence of compromise. As we conduct investigations, we try to figure out what is the earliest evidence of what the attacker has done within the environment. And based on our investigation, the earliest evidence was a login to the Colonial Pipeline VPN. And we do know that a um, employee's credentials were used, so a username and a password was used to do that. We did not figure out exactly um, how the attacker was able to get access to the username, um, but it is uh, a possibility that the attacker was able to leverage credentials that the employee may have used on another website that was compromised prior to this date. And so it is certainly possible that that is how the attacker got in. Um, whether or not the vulnerability or the misconfiguration, and let me you know, you know, clarify it as a misconfiguration, whether it would have been picked up uh, by a vulnerability assessment is, is hard to tell. But um, I, I just want to clarify that what actually occurred was there was a legacy VPN profile that was in place that wasn't believed to be active, and that enabled an attacker to leverage both a user and a password to log in. So how would one correct that problem? Yeah, so the problem has been corrected at this point in time. The legacy VPN profile has been completely removed. And, um, and so a, a, a user, whether an attacker or an employee, would not be able to attempt to log into the system without requiring multi-factor authentication. So in addition to a password, you would need a one-time code in order to be able to log into the Colonial Pipeline VPN at this point in time. All right, so you just said it was a common password that allowed the, the, the breach to occur? Yeah, so I want to clarify, the password that the account was set to was not a common password. It was not an easily guessable password. In fact, it was a relatively complex password in terms of length, special characters, and case set. It wasn't something that somebody would be able to easily guess or predict. However, it was a password that had been used on a different website at some point in time. And I just want the group and the audience to understand that it's actually really common for everyday people to use similar passwords or the same exact passwords across different websites, across social media accounts or email accounts or financial accounts. And this is a very common problem. And so unfortunately what happened here is a password for an account that wasn't believed to be in use anymore had the same password um, as what was used for that um, employee on a different website that had unfortunately been compromised. I understand, uh, but you know, we're not talking about ordinary people. We're talking about uh, a pipeline that control, controls 55% of the energy resources in the Northeast. So you would expect uh, a more robust uh, system than just an ordinary system. Understood. Thank you. Chair recognizes the, the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to uh, Mr. Blount and Mr. Carmichael for being here today. This is a very, very important hearing, and not just for what happened at Colonial Pipeline, but what, what we can do going forward to protect our critical infrastructure and our, our, our computer systems nationwide. This is, a, this is an issue that's getting more uh, ubiquitous, unfortunately, and we, we're going to have to deal with it. So, uh, Mr. Blount, I, I appreciate your candor and I appreciate your professionalism of testifying, I, and I'm not interested in playing gotcha, but I do want to clear up something from yesterday. You were asked a question by, I believe it was Senator Hawley, about the money you spent to secure your systems, and I think you spent, said over the past decade it was over $200 million, but I think that includes 
for your entire IT system uh, altogether, correct? That's not just for the hardening of that system. Ranking, ranking member Katko, that is a correct statement. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. And um, uh, you talked about hardening the system now, right? And uh, again, I'm not trying to play got you, but um, I know you've, uh, you you referenced a little bit about the hardening of the system before. What are you doing now that you weren't doing before to harden your system? Uh, I, I thought that was a good point you made before because I think a lot of people are hearing about hardening of the system right now and they think that that means that operators haven't been doing that all along. As we all know, these threat actors uh, evolve very quickly. Uh, they have very sophisticated tools. So all responsible operators are continuing to assess their investment and where they need to go next. So from a colonial perspective, as I stated previously, um, we've, had a, we've had a bad actor, we've had a criminal inside our system. So we're making a lot of changes in our system with the help of, of Mandiant as they go about restoring our systems as, as well as mitigating the damage done. And again, with Dragos and, and Black Hills involved, we'll be doing a lot of things differently uh, that we certainly could share with you probably more one-on-one -on -one, uh, because we don't want to give a roadmap to the outside criminal characters uh, that they can come in and have a successful attack again. Uh, but we've got a lot of things in progress right now and we'll continue to make those investments. We take cybersecurity and as well as physical security extremely serious at Colonial. So that, that's where we're headed. We're heading towards a lot more hardening and a lot different architecture than we had before, mainly because we've been compromised and we need to change the architecture so that it's not as, as easily uh, known uh, by previous perpetrators. Yeah, and I understand. I appreciate your, your candidness there. Uh, my, my concern is you've, you're learning from the attack, right? First question is, how do we get other critical infrastructure um, uh, ent entities that have not been subject to attack yet? And I hope they never do, but if they haven't been subject to attack, how do we get them to take those similar additional steps that you are now taking out of necessity? Um, how do we get them to pay attention to this issue? You have uh, competing interests all the time for your budgets, but uh, there's no question this is going to cost money, but there's no question that the critical infrastructures across this country have to do it. And I'm quite confident that they're not all doing it. So what would you say to them? Or how would you, what, would, what do you think we should be doing to help them uh, basically see the light? I'm you're muted, sir, I'm sorry. I knew I'd get that wrong at some point. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, ranking member, I, I share your concern. Uh, you know, as a large operator who has been making investments in this area, I think that we, we need to work together and find a way to work together to share those best practices and, and what makes sense and perhaps what made sense yesterday that no longer makes sense today as the threat actor continues to evolve. Uh, you know, we participate, all of us responsible operators participate in a lot of tabletop exercises and, and we have standards that we, we follow like API security standards for SCADA and things like that. But I think we need to continue to communicate, communicate and communicate. You know, the one fortunate thing about this unfortunate event, it certainly highlighted the risk to all the operators in, in the United States and it certainly has heightened the government's focus on the issue. And again, as, as private operators, we can continue to make the investments and do the things that we should do to be accountable and responsible. But there's certainly things that the federal government can do, like approach the hosts of these, these bad actors in these foreign countries and things like that and put political pressure on them so that we can stop it before it even starts. Well, the president certainly has an opportunity to do that this week when he meets with uh, President Putin, that's for sure. Uh, yesterday in your hearing, you mentioned that the free services offered by CISA generally weren't considered to be value adds uh, to what you're already doing. Is there something more that CISA could be providing that would further enhance your engagement with them? Because you want to make CISA uh, more, more proactive in this area. Ranking Member Portman, you know, as, as I look at lessons learned along the way, I think one of the things I saw pretty, pretty early on uh, 
was the involvement of all the federal agencies, which we greatly appreciated. If I look at it from a CISA loan perspective, some of the things that I saw them doing was participating in the FBI calls, learning about uh, you know, indications of compromise, uh, evidence that, that they could sort through and then figure out how to share with others in the industry on a real-time basis. Uh, you know, the new mandates that they have right now are designed to do the same thing. If, if you're being attacked or being, someone's knocking on that door every day, you know, uh, is there a random pattern there or is there an actual pattern of threat there that they can share with all the industry? I think those are the things that, you know, we should see policies around and, and focus on on the part of CISA uh, that would be helpful to all operators of critical infrastructure in the United States today. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how much time I have left. I just want to check with you real quick. Question. Pardon me? One more question. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Carmack, I want to give you an opportunity to comment. What can we do to make sure that the other other uh, critical infrastructure entities across the spectrum uh, take the cybersecurity and, and the uh, hardening uh, uh, actions that they need to take that a lot of them just aren't taking. So yeah. what can we do other than what, what Mr. Blount has, uh, has stated? Yep. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I really think what we need to do is share as much information as we possibly can about the threat actor, the threats, and really what um, some of the learnings at uh, Colonial Pipeline, as well as other organizations that are dealing with cyber attacks on a day-to-day -day basis are learning from their investigations and their response. And so if we can get information out to other organizations more quickly, I think it'll help enable them to better defend their environments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the young lady from Texas for five minutes, Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, thank you so very much for this hearing. Uh, let me um, express the urgency that I feel about this particular uh, crisis that we're in the midst of. Uh, to both gentlemen, we know that the private sector over the years has had 85% of the nation's critical infrastructure, including cyber. Uh, and I would make the point at this time, 2021, uh, that uh, because of this major uh, crux of calamity that we face, that the private sector can no longer go it alone. Mr. Blunt, do you agree with that? That the private sector can no longer go it alone with respect uh, to its uh, infrastructure that it possesses versus the federal government? Thank you, Representative Lee, for your question. I, th I think there's no question that these threat actors are extremely capable. Uh, they're housed in, in countries other than the U.S. Uh, we're responsible as operators for our own internal security and our cybersecurity, but we need the government's help to put pressure on the host countries so that we can stop these attacks before they start. Thank you. Can you explain again uh, why uh, when you were requested to provide information as to whether or not you paid ransom that you hesitated and took really a considerable length of time to the extent that it was reported that the White House was not getting a direct answer regarding whether you paid ransom? Representative Lee, as far as the White House uh, goes, they never asked whether we, they never talked about the ransom at all, period. Never had a question about it from anybody that I talked to. Uh, never had a question about it from any of my employees that talked to federal agencies. So that's, that's the reason why the White House, they, they, they weren't, they never asked about it. Who uh, was the first governmental entity that you reported to that indicated that you paid ransom? Uh, the first entity that we reported to that we paid ransom would be in the FBI. And what was the gap between the time that you paid it and the time that you spoke to the FBI? The, the, the time? Representative Lee, I'd say that was approximately 48 hours. I could, I could give you a more definitive number, but that would, that would be my guessment. Thank you so very much. So it was two days, it was a two day gap between the time you paid it and the time uh, you spoke to the FBI. Representative Lee, I, I, I would share with you that obviously we communicated with the FBI throughout uh, the, the course of the week, shared a lot of evidence with them, uh, and, and, and made ourselves Thank as you. open as we possibly could. 
Thank you very much. And let me again compliment the FBI for uh, being able to secure dollars. Uh, this may be your question, I think, Mr. Carmichael. Uh, why wasn't a multi-factor uh, authentication used on that VPN? I'm going to give you a series of questions if you want to take quick notes because my time is running out. And who had a legitimate access to that password? And where else was the password used? Uh, and was the password listed in any of the company's online documentation? So it's auth uh, authentication, uh, legitimate access to that password. So you want to start with the authentication? Sure. Uh, if you can be concise and as quickly as possible. Yes, thanks, ma'am. Um, in terms of multi-factor authentication, it was not um, required for the specific VPN profile that was used for this specific account. It's because the account and the VPN profile wasn't believed to actually be enabled. And so it was okay. unknown at the can time. I move to, yes. I, can I move to the next question? Who yes, had legitimate access to the password, sir? Um, one person, as far as we know. And is that person vetted? From your perspective? Yeah, it's uh, it was a, an employee's account. Where else was the password used? Um, we do not know the exact source of the website that it was used, but um, uh, presumably it was used on at least one other website because there are passwords that are readily available um, on the internet, and we did find that it was uh, one of the passwords that was stolen from another website, but we don't know exactly where it came from. And was the password listed in any of the company's online documentation? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I am, um, you started out by saying you can't go it alone. We are ready to help you. I introduced HR 2980, um, which uh, deals with Cybersecurity Vulnerability Remediation Act. The committee was kind enough to pass it out of the uh, committee, hopefully go to the floor. But the, the, the crux of this is um, that part of it is a reporting feature uh, that uh, really requires uh, companies to, uh, the DHS to secure a report uh, that uh, indicates what kind of mitigation companies are engaged in. Do you think that if a company crosses into the public domain, and when I say that, Colonial Pipeline impacts, um, as you well know, uh, massive um, energy streams that literally shut down the East Coast, that the government should come in more quickly than it obviously did because it has moved into the public domain. Do you believe that that would be an appropriate approach in terms of assessing how the government comes in to help those who've been attacked? Uh, I think private corporations would welcome any support they could get from the government dealing with cybersecurity incidents. Okay. General Thank ladies, you, time Mr. Is expired. Yes, ma'am. Very much. Chair recognized gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Blount, um, this is a fourth uh, recent attack by either Russia is a nation state or organized uh, Russian mafia. Um, you know, this is the kind of the thing that keeps us up at night, a, a pipeline shutting down in the nation from New York to Houston. Uh, the problem is I see it, the chairman and I stood up CISA into law, uh, which is on the defensive side. Uh, but the problem as I see it is we continue to see hundreds of these attacks billions of dollars in ransomware, and yet there's no, uh, there's no consequence to bad behavior. Um, they get away with this every day. Um, I introduced and um, marked up on the Foreign Affairs Committee the Cyber uh, Diplomacy Act, which sets up an ambassador at large at the State Department to set up international norms and standards. So Mr. Blunt, my question to you is, as the president now is going to sit down with Mr. Putin, and certainly I hope the president's gonna raise uh, these attacks, the recent attacks by Russia, either as a nation state or by organized crime. Uh, I believe that we need to start thinking about going on the offensive and hitting them back. And there should be consequences. And in a recent statement, you stated, ultimately the government needs to focus on the actors themselves. As a private company, we don't have a political capability of shutting down the host countries that have had these bad actors in them. Uh, do you agree with uh, my bill, but also, more importantly, that we need to start, stop uh, just taking it. We need to respond and we need to start hitting them back. Do you agree with that assessment? Representative, I, I, I appreciate your leadership in this particular issue. That, that does very much address what you read in, in the press statement that I made. 
we have a responsibility, obviously, as operators to continue to strengthen our systems and, and protect our, our, our asset base. But we have to stop the, the threat actor themselves. We have to stop the criminals. And that's something private industry can't do without a partnership with, with, with the public sector. So I think your, your, your proposal is dead on, and we certainly support it. And I think every other operator in the United States would love to see us stand up and, and push back and, and not allow this to continue. And it's unfortunate it had to take a hit on a you know, critical infrastructure asset to get the focus that it's getting now. But I think it's very important. And again, I appreciate your leadership on it. And, and thank you, Mr. Blunt. Uh, Mr. Carmichael, um, you know, FireEye has been a leader in this issue. And, um, you know, I, we, um, uh, Congressman Longevin and I introduced a um, mandatory breach notification uh, law. Uh, you know, CIS is only as good as the information it gets. And the private sector has the majority of the threat information. Um, I think uh, Colonial Pipeline did a good job notifying CISA, but other companies don't. And uh, would you agree with the assessment or the, the tone of this bill that we need to start looking at, instead of 50 different states, a federal, federal law, instead of patchwork of 50 states, that would require a mandatory breach notification if the identifiers can be taken out, the, it can be sanitized and scrubbed, like we do with uh, classified information uh, so that the fiduciary duty is, is not uh, compromised in any way. But the threat information is mandatorily shared with CISA so it can better protect the nation from these attacks. Yeah, uh, Congressman, I certainly agree that uh, right now the data breach disclosure laws are highly complex. Every state has their own uh, nuanced requirements and it will certainly be a welcome change um, to have one um, standard um, data breach disclosure uh, requirement. Uh, it'll be much more simple for the organizations that are trying to figure out the complexity around notification requirements. In terms of getting information out to help other organizations defend themselves, absolutely, we agree with the, the spirit and the intent of that. We, we welcome the opportunity for CISA to take that information and disseminate it as best as they can. But they certainly need victim organizations to come forward and provide that uh, uh, the, the threat information to them so they have something to share. I think one of the challenges that organizations deal with today is the, the fear, the repercussions, and the scrutiny around data breaches. And so if there is a way to get information out to the government, to CISA, and to the broader community in a way where it doesn't feel like the victim organizations are gonna face a penalty, I think that would be a welcome change. Last uh, question to you, uh, sir, would be, you know, we don't allow private companies to hack back, right? That's illegal and it would create a wild west scenario. But what is your opinion of the federal government protecting itself and responding in kind to nation state actors when they perpetrate these acts of, of cyber warfare, for lack of a better term, because they are destructive and it shut down you know, the energy supply for days on the East Coast. What would be the best way to show them that there are consequences to their bad actions? Yeah, so uh, I, I certainly agree that uh, private organizations sh shouldn't hack back, but from a government perspective and perhaps you know, certain select private organizations that maybe have the capability and the uh, operational security to, to be able to, uh, to conduct these offensive operations, I certainly think there is a, a way and an opportunity to disrupt the aggressive threat actors that continue to cause havoc uh, in the United States. And so I, I do believe that there is an opportunity for us to get more aggressive, but we certainly need to define what are the rules of engagement. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the time to ask it now and uh, the international norms and standards need to be set with our allies and uh, across the, uh, the, the globe. And uh, with that, uh, thank you, gentlemen's time has expired. Chair recognizes gentleman from Rhode Island for five minutes, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank Mr. Blount and uh, Mr. Carmichael, for, Mr. Carmichael for your testimony here today and helping us to understand this. I have a list of questions I want to get through and you could be as brief and direct as possible. It would be appreciated. So uh, if I could start with uh, Mr. Blount. Um, so I understand that Colonial has cyber insurance. Uh, so do you expect your insurers uh, to cover, uh, will cover the uh, $4.4 million ransom payment? 
Uh, Congressman, uh, thank you for that question. We do have cyber insurance. Um, we've had cyber insurance for quite some time. Uh, we have submitted a claim for that um, ransom payment, and uh, I haven't had that confirmed to me yet, but uh, I suspect that it will be covered. Okay, thank you. Um, did you have discussions about whether uh, your insurers would cover the ransom payment uh, before you made the decision to pay? I think there were consultations going on uh, through my CI, CFO at the time, uh, but that wasn't my focus. Again, my focus was to get access to that de-encryptor, to have all the options that I could get available to me in an effort to try to restart that pipeline as quickly and safely as possible. So from my perspective, the insurance wasn't even in the forefront of my mind. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Bond, uh, yesterday you testified that uh, you recommended to other companies that they be, and I quote, extremely transparent in their contact uh, with the authorities uh, who uh, indeed uh, do have resources that uh, potentially could help you through a very, uh, very difficult process, end quote. Um, so in talking with CISA, my understanding is that regional representatives offered colonial assistance, uh, including assistance, ensuring that the incident was contained and uh, validating the integrity of your OT network. Uh, allowing CISA uh, to help on your network could also allow them to provide better information to other critical in infrastructure entities. And uh, uh, you know, I'm not interested in litigating the past month uh, of what um, uh, services were offered uh, when, but will you commit today to take CISA up on their offer uh, of direct assistance on your network? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, representative for that question. Uh, just for clarity, we, we reached out almost immediately to Mandy at that morning to, to basically do the same thing, which is to come in, investigate, and help restore our systems. By the time that the conversation with CISA took place with the FBI, they were well engaged and in the process of doing that. I think CISA offers great services for companies that perhaps don't have the resources we have to, to bring in the best in class with regard to people like Mandiant, Dragos, and Black Hills. So I think that's a good service. But in this particular case, we were already engaged. All right. Yeah, let me uh, stop you there if I could. You know, uh, you've testified that, you know, uh, if, if there was a 1% chance that OT could be affected, uh, it, it's worth shutting it down. Well, you know, in that light, you know, isn't it, isn't it if, if there's a 1% chance uh, that Mandian I had missed something. Isn't it worth uh, bringing CISA in? Is aren't uh, two sets of eyes better than one? Representative, with, with all due respect, I have three sets of eyes in already with the parties that, that I've explained we've engaged with. Okay. So from, from my perspective, I, I don't think having a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth gets productive. Yeah, I right. think that CISA has been very, very helpful in the process of sharing information that they've learned through us. Yeah. indications and compromise and things like that to other operators and again so i think they can so be you're, not going, you're not going to take them up in there uh on their offer of direct assistance on your networks at this time again uh representative we we have three world-class experts in there right now yeah okay uh, Mr. Pine, uh, what uh, uh what outside firms did colonial contact before manny Representative, as I said earlier, we contacted um, the FBI uh, and Mandiant almost yeah. simultaneously. Did that you morning. contact outside legal counsel, though, before you hired Mandiant and the legal counsel hired Mandiant? We have retained outside legal counsel and, yes, probably did talk to them for Mandiant. I'd have to give you the timeline on that. I'm not as familiar with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Carmichael uh, testified that Mandy uh, was retained uh, by an outside legal firm. Uh, are you contending that, uh, so you contacted Mandy uh, before uh, Huntington Andrews Kurth LLP or, or was it the other way around? I'm just curious to why. Representative, I'm, I'm sorry, Representative, is that question for me? I thought you were addressing Mr. Yeah. Carmichael. No, this, that was for you. I'm sorry. Mr. Carmichael had uh, testified that Mandiant was retained uh, by outside uh, legal counsel. That is a correct statement, yes, sir. Okay, and why did you retain Mandiant services uh, through outside counsel? 
Uh, Representative, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to ask my general counsel why we went down that that avenue. Okay, I, I see my time's expired, but uh, and a bunch of other questions. Hopefully, we can submit those for the record. Uh, thank you for your time here today, uh, Mr. Baum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chairman, you have to unmute. Mr. Gavarino for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, some questions for Mr. Blunt. Um, as you may know, uh, information sharing and analysis centers, or ISACs, can provide member owners and operators useful services and insight into the current threats facing their sectors. Uh, this can include information sharing, actionable intelligence, federal and private sector information, and, and more. Yesterday, you, uh, in front of the Senate, you said you weren't sure if Colonial was a member of an ISAC. Have you tracked down that answer yet? Is Colonial mem a member of the oil and natural gas ISAC? Uh, thank you for, for asking for that clarification because I actually did do that and indeed we are. It's the acronym that threw me off. I've heard it through the long name, not through the acronym. So I wanted to be careful yesterday that I stated it correctly. Okay, so you are a member. So can you provide in detail your engagement with them? Uh, how do you leverage their services? What do you provide back to the group? Uh, we're, we're a learning organization and it's in our DNA to share. Uh, we participate in a lot of uh, industry uh, collaborative processes like that. I would have to call upon my CIO to really explain in detail exactly what they share with regard to our systems and how we approach uh, cyber risk and, and all those things. But again, we belong to a lot of organizations like that that have also have a lot of acronyms and they may differ from cyber all the way to pipeline integrity and, and things like that. Okay, so uh, so C your CIO is the one who deals directly with, uh, with the oil and natural gas ISAC. That is correct, Representative, or okay. someone on her staff. Okay, um, how often do you, uh, would you say you meet with your CIO? Thank you for that question. I meet with my staff every day. We, we have a staff meeting every day. So I meet with each one of my executives every morning. And uh, typically throughout the day, I'll have one-on-ones with them. And certainly at least twice a month, I meet with each one of them one-on-one -on -one to talk about things in general. So constant contact, it's a small team. It's a very close-knit team. So you, you in the past year, you met with your CIO every day how, for how long is, is that meeting? Is, is it just a morning meeting? Is it just updates? What, what's discussed when you, or, or, and you know, you meet every day, but are there more in-depth uh, discussions about cyber uh, risk and, and whatnot? And how many times do you have those meetings? Yeah, Representative, the, the meetings that we have in the morning uh, revolve around a lot of topics. Uh, it's with the entire team. They can last anywhere from one hour to upwards of three hours. And then, as I said, I, you know, in the COVID environment, I have to kind of do a virtual walk around. I don't have the ability to, to knock on doors in the office anymore, but uh, it's not unusual for me to talk to any of the executives that work for me once or twice a day, in addition to the, the morning meeting. And then uh, if we have things that we want to talk about in depth, we, we make appointments and we spend whatever time we need to on those critical matters. Okay, so following the uh, breach, how many, uh, how many meetings have you had with your CIO specifically about the breach? and what you're going to do uh, to better protect your uh, the pipeline. Uh, well, thank you for that question. That's, that's a really good question. Uh, we, we, again, we meet every day as a management team. Uh, my CIO has been very engaged in the restoration process with Mandiant. And certainly if you go back to the first week of it, fully engaged 24 seven every day until we got the pipeline system back up. So there might have been a few touch bases during that week, but for the most part, we let her run with the Mandiant team to make sure that we brought this critical infrastructure up. Since that time, uh, both her uh, time and my time has been used in forums like this, which are helpful to get the word out about what happened to us so that it might prevent this from happening to other people. I still talk to her every day, but, but the length of those discussions varies depending upon both our schedules. But again, we're both focused on this particular issue. And quite frankly, that's all we've been focused on for the last month. I appreciate that. Um, 
Now, uh, you just answered the previous uh, member's question about, you know, it, you, when he asked about allowing CISA in uh, to help with your systems, it sounded like that was not something you were interested in. Uh, TSA had offered its assistance prior to the attack, I believe once last year during COVID and again back in March, uh, and you turned them down last year. Uh, I don't believe there was an answer yet uh, as to allowing them in in March. Do you intend on uh, uh, allowing them to come in and uh, do a diagnostic check or, or, or at least run a program uh, on your system like they had offered twice before the attack? Uh, Representative, let me address that question. Uh, the, the word turn down, I've heard as well. I've also heard the word refusal. That Neither one of those is the case. We, we've worked with TSA for a long time. They've done a lot of physical security audits for, with us, uh, work collaboratively with them. In fact, they actually filled in for FEMSA last year on a virtual uh, uh, audit that took place on one of our facilities. Uh, with regard to the VADAR program, we never denied uh, wanting to do it. It's a voluntary program, as you know. It was a function of scheduling. Uh, we were getting ready and still getting ready to move into a new facility as our lease expired. And so I think the conversation, again, between my CIO and the director of security over there was a function of when it would be best to do it. I do know that that's been scheduled at the end of July. Thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much. Here, recognized gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Kane, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for um, once again having this timely hearing. Um, <clears throat> see, Mr. Mr. Blount, <clears throat> since uh, March 2020, your company has been um, contacted at least uh, nine times by TSA to schedule. Um, you know, the CFR, uh, CFSR, uh, on at least three occasions, including April 16, 2020, just before a ransomware attack, Colonial did not bother to respond to TSA's request for a security assessment. Uh, to this date, even after the attack, um, I guess we're, we're, we're going over the same, uh, hashing over the same thing. Um, and um, could you just clarify for me why you um, opt not to participate in TSA's um, CFSR security assessment? Representative, I'd be glad to answer your question on that. Again, we think the VADAR program is a good program. We have a good working relationship with TSA. It's been a function of timing. And again, we've never refused or denied uh, the, the part of wanting to participate in that program as a volunteer. And that's why it is scheduled here at the end of July. Okay. Um, and uh, I understand a typical TSA pipeline security assessment involves um, three to four TSA employees. Uh, given your company's COVID-19 concerns, were any small groups of individuals not employed by Colonial Pipeline allowed in into um, your facility since the beginning of the pandemic? And if so, um, for what purpose? Representative, you can appreciate that uh, we have essential employees in our operation, just like all pipeline companies do, just like all utilities do. So in our Alpharetta office, our headquarters in Georgia, uh, we have a rotating shift of controllers in a control room. Uh, and our concern and all operators' concerns at the outbreak of COVID was how do we protect these essential workers? They're not people that can be replaced any, by any just anybody. They're, they're kind of like air traffic controllers. They're highly trained, they're certified. And so we almost immediately uh, with the, the breakout of COVID went to remote, remote work for all our employees and all our vendors in order to protect those essential workers that work in that office. So there's been no one in that office that I'm aware of other than some potentially uh, critical repair that needed to be done on something. And, and, and I'm not even sure about that. Highly protected work workspace. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, sir. And, um, you know, we are, um, you know, just concerned um, with respect to what's happened to you um, um, to make sure that, uh, you know, TSA is able to um, uh, help uh, with respect to these issues. And, um, you know, we just want to know, will you commit to participate in the 
TSA's uh, CFSR uh, inspection as soon as TSA can conduct one or as soon as you can um, work it out? Yeah, Representative, we've already committed to a date. And again, I think it's the last, one of the last days in July. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I take a minute to make a statement, please? Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a clarification on a statement that I made to Representative Jackson Lee. We shared information with the FBI about the digital wallet on Sunday and discussed the specific ransom payment on Wednesday. The Justice Department, in its announcement a few days ago, commended us for the quick communication with authorities. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Van Drew for five minutes. Hi, Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Thompson, for having this meeting, and I want to thank you and, of course, Member Kako and members of the committee. You know that we have a serious problem on our hands. Hackers who are primarily located in Russia have developed sophisticated methods of infiltrating the federal government, state and local governments, and private sector entities in the United States. As we saw just about a month ago, with the ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline, America is very vulnerable, frankly, too vulnerable to these attacks. They can have crippling ramifications, like gas shortages throughout the entire country. The attack on Colonial demonstrates the need to shore up our cyber defenses through initiatives such as public-private partnerships and more communication and more accountability in both the public and the private sector. It is of extreme importance. I find it deeply concerning that Russian hackers, through a compromised password on a virtual proxy network, were able to essentially shut down a 5,500 mile pipeline that supplied roughly 45% of the fuel consumed by the East Coast of the United States of America. Shortly after the attack on Colonial, Meatpacker JBS was the victim of ransomware attack that caused major disruptions in the United States meat supply. And it also expected that the perpetration of this attack are Russian-based as well. The FBI Director Christopher Wray recently said that the current levels of ransomware attacks can be compared to the challenges proposed by the 7 September 11, 2001 attacks, that they could be compared to that, and that there are a lot of parallels. Obviously, if the FBI director is comparing anything to the level of September 11, Congress and the federal government need to pay attention. I commend the Biden administration for its recent executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity and encouraging the administration to work with the members of the committee on practical, effective solutions on protecting America and our critical infrastructure. So I have a few questions. Mr. Joseph Blount, I understand the Transportation Secretary, I'm sorry, I'm, the Transportation Security Administration contacted Colonial multiple times to conduct a validated architecture design review, VADR, to evaluate your company's cyber posture, but you refuse to move forward with the evaluation. Can you help me and my colleagues on the committee understand why you declined? Gentleman is muted. Unmute yourself. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, I'll be glad to address that. I've, I've heard that word refusal over the course of the past month. I, I don't know where it emanates from. We've had an ongoing discussion with TSA about that VADAR program. We think the VADAR program is a good program. We have a historically good working relationship with TSA. We've participated in any number of security audits with them throughout the years. They've been in our headquarters in Alpharetta, Texas. I've met the administrator on multiple occasions. It's been simply a function of timing on when to do the assessment. There's never been a refusal, and we have that planned at the end of July to have that assessment done. It's a good program. Thank you. Um, I'm glad it's a good program. 
Um, did, didn't it seem to you that it could be done in a more timely way uh, rather than, you know, this period of time and we're still waiting to the end of July and here we are in the beginning of June? Uh, Representative, I think the issue has been uh, we've been getting ready to move into a new facility. Our lease has expired. The discussion between my CIO and the director of the security group at the TSA has been more around what's the best date for them as well as the best date for us. Again, I don't know where the word refusal comes from. We've never refused anything like that with the TSA. And you state that categorically, okay, that, okay, that you absolutely- no, no question about that, Representative, no, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, you state that you paid the ransom demanded by the dark side, but also admitted that the decryption tool that they provided you did not entirely work. What made you decide to pay the ransom? And did you agree that paying ransom in, in one important sense is rewarding bad behavior? Representative, I, I'd love to address that. If I go back to May 7th, 6 a.m. in the morning when I found out about the attack, uh, automatically started focusing on how do, how do we contain the threat? How do, how do we restart our systems now that we're taking them down? Uh, like all good operators, I have to avail myself of every available option that I have. Uh, and the paying the ransom allowed me access uh, not only to the de-encryption tool, but also additional services that DarkSight offers those whose systems they've corrupted. When you're moving 100 million gallons of fuel uh, to the American public every day, 50 million, million Americans, and you think you can potentially get there quicker, bring that system on quicker by having that tool, then you avail yourself of that tool. Tough decision to make, did not like handing that money over to criminals, but it was a decision that I made in order to support the country. Okay. Gentlemen, I yours this time has expired. All right. I, I can recognize the young lady from Michigan. Uh, Ms. Thank Locke. you, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, and welcome to um, our guests. Um, I appreciate your professionalism in showing up and, and answering what I cannot imagine to be fun questions about what I'm sure will will be a um, a dark day in your professional experience. I can't imagine that this is easy. Um, after the attack, I wrote a letter to a bunch of the the pipeline companies that go through the state of Michigan just to ask, you know, what were they doing? What were they learning? And I'm more interested at this point in trying to understand how we learn from your experience, because I can't imagine any company in the world wants to go through what you're going through. Um, and if the attack wasn't bad enough, then the hearing I'm sure <laughs> will will prove to them that they should not want this to happen to them. Um, but uh, you know, I am concerned. Um, we have the deputy attorney general calling it a clear, clear and present danger. Are these cyber attacks? We have a former secretary of defense saying he's just waiting for our cyber 9/11 to happen and. If it hasn't happened, then this incident, I think, with your company is the USS Cole attack before 9-11. It's the warning that we should all see before an attack that really debilitates us in a much more profound way. Um, and so I guess you've answered lots of questions about what you're doing differently. Um, you know, you mentioned a bunch of tabletop exercises and things that you did, but obviously they, they did not work, right? And I guess my question is, are you allowing researchers, kind of the white hat hackers, to try and get into your system? Are you using kind of that approach where you're allowing people to try and attack you, um, not just doing a tabletop exercise on what you would do, but actually trying to let them into your system? Have you done that before? Uh, Representative, first let me thank you for your kind words. I appreciate those. Very nice of you to do that. Yes, we, we, we participate in penetration tests. We participate in audits and, and that's by design to try to find weaknesses. And if you find weaknesses, then determine how you best remedy them. And of course, if you consider how fast uh, the criminal element is growing and the, their skills are growing, you have to continually stress test your system in order to stay ahead of the curve. It's like all technology, it changes constantly. And that's why you're continually hardening your systems and making those investments. So I and appreciate you, You've invited outsiders to do this, not just folks inside your own system, but outside organizations, outside uh, groups that do this for a living? Representative, absolutely, because you, you run the risk of being myopic if you were to do it yourself. You, you have to have outside experts 
you know, similar to the reason we brought Mandiant in to help us restore our systems and to determine what happened to us and running the investigation. That's the absolute right thing to do. And I think all responsible operators are doing that. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, beyond the pipeline companies that go through Michigan and, and through our Great Lakes, um, you know, the average company doesn't have nearly the resources that you have, doesn't have nearly the staff that you have. And I think a lot of us um, are, are looking at, you know, if you can't and other companies like you can't protect against these attacks, what are the little guys supposed to do who are even less in touch with some of the latest and greatest in cybersecurity? Um, I have tried to get at this problem by requiring um, a DHS to help state and locals figure this out and do more tabletop exercises. Um, but if you could could give a message to the CEOs of those companies on wit, what you wish you would have done differently ahead of time, what would that message be? Well, I, th I think the message is, that I'd like to share, Representative, is, is we need to be aware of what's going on. Uh, and, and we've gotten a lot more press about it here in the last month as a result of this particular incident. But we can't be complacent in our defenses. And, and just as importantly to preventing the attack is we really need to work hard and most operators are capable of doing it. And we certainly have demonstrated that we must respond immediately to contain that threat, recognize the threat, contain that threat, remediate and then be able to restore our systems. And I think a lot of pipeline operators, for the most part, know how to do that. It's inherent. We all have those emergency response processes. And then the other thing that's most important, and we've talked about it earlier today in this forum, is, is the willingness to be very transparent and come forward extremely quickly. And I think what we've seen in the United States over the course of the last month, a lot of companies admitting that they were hacked and paid ransom three or four months ago. That's not helping defend any of other companies that are being attacked, let alone critical infrastructure. I couldn't agree more. Being able to be transparent with the public has to be the first step. I also just want to associate myself with the comments of a, a peer who talked about the absolute lack of deterrence, the absolute lack of punishment and consequences for the people who conduct these attacks. And until we get at that, we're going to have more CEOs in front of our committee. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Now, Lady Yields, thank Chair recognizes Mr. Norman, five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Carmichael, dark side, uh, the Russian hackers that uh, caused pipe, caused colonial pipeline attack, it really seems to enjoy the approval of uh, the Russian government, Putin. Uh, is this one of the roles, I think Dr. McCall asked, this that that government can uh, uh, can use to prevent Russia from approving this. Do you agree with this, Mr. Carmichael? Uh, thank you. Mr. Carmichael, thank can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the dark side group is it, it is a network of different operators that conduct intrusions on behalf of the dark side name. So um, while there is a requirement to be affiliated with the dark side group um, that you have to speak the Russian language, it doesn't ex doesn't mean that every single operator is oper is is located within Russia. Uh, we we assess that the majority of the operators are Eastern European you know, criminals. And so, um, you know, we certainly would request U.S. government to help with uh, um, encouraging the Russian government and other governments that uh, harbor these criminals um, to try to apprehend them and uh, discourage them and stop them from conducting these operations. Would you not think it would make sense? Uh, this administration has removed the sanctions for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Would you not think uh, this would play into putting the sanctions back on? Uh, to have leverage against Russia, just asking them, I don't think that's going to get the job done, but they need some, we need leverage. Wouldn't that be one of the tools that Mr. Biden could suggest when he meets with Putin this week? Yeah, uh, Congressman, I, I'd certainly defer to the government to, to make decisions like that. You know, I want to focus on cybersecurity and, and um, you know, um, that would be outside of my expertise. Okay, Mr. Blunt, yesterday in the hearing, you said the description tool that you purchased from DarkSide was not a perfect tool. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, yes, Mr. Representative, I, I'll, I will do that and then Mr. perhaps. Are we on mute again? No, you, you, you unmute it. Am I on? Uh, Mr. Yes, Representative, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry. Uh, to, res fine. to respond to your question, Mr. Representative, uh, I did make the statement yesterday that the, the tool is not perfect, and I heard that's often the case. The tool has been used, and, and Mandy probably could speak further to that. But again, uh, for me, not knowing in those critical hours in the morning what I had and my capability to bring that pipeline system back on as, as soon as possible, I had to run the risk that the tool perhaps wasn't perfect, but indeed it was a tool and it was advertised as being able to de-encrypt a massive amount of material on my system that had been encrypted. So if, if you rewound the clock, knowing what you know now, Mr. Blunt, what would you... What's your opinion of the type of things Colonial needs to do moving forward to well, prevent re this from happening again? Yeah, if I reround the clock, I'd say that you know we can need to continue to do what we've been doing, which is continue to invest in defense. But you know, granted, we've we've talked today in this forum already that nobody's immune to an attack, and and we, like any operator, get hit millions of times a day by people trying to do the same thing that we saw Darkside do. Fortunately, we have the defenses to stop that. And I'm certainly, if we started to pull all these reports that the operators have been filing every 12 hours, you're gonna see that that's not unique to us. That goes on at every operator in every, every state in this country right now. It's a massive amount of volume of attacks that we're dealing with. So again- Yeah, you guys- I was just going to say I agree with you. You've got 4,000 ransomware attacks every day. So a lot of companies, because of their name and don't want it out, how, how would you incentivize other companies to come forward, share what they've learned, uh, and work with you to prevent this from happening? I, I encourage it. I, Mark, I think, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We hear you. Very good. I encourage all CEOs who, who have been hacked and subject to a cyber attack to be very transparent about it. It's the only way we're going to learn that these, these attacks continue to change. There's variants of these attacks. Any information we can get on a timely basis is helpful to everybody in this country to help avoid and help deal with after the fact responding to these type of hacks. I'm sure there's any number of reasons why people are hesitant to it, that perhaps they're embarrassed, perhaps they're, they have a brand name they're trying to protect, but I think in the long run, transparency and honesty with regard to this particular topic is extremely important to all American citizens in our effort to try to stop what we're seeing become more and more a daily event. Okay. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair, I recognize the gentlelady from New York for five minutes. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank the ranking member. It's a very important hearing, and I'm so glad that uh, we have the witnesses before us today. Mr. Blunt, I just wanted to circle back to a, um, a question that was raised by my colleague, Mr. Langevin. We know that you hired Mandiant. Uh, through your outside counsel. And, and my question to you is, did you or your legal team have any discussions about retaining Mandiant through counsel in order to place any of the findings that you've been able to obtain under attorney-client privilege? Representative, I wasn't involved in the hiring of Mandiant. We would have to talk to my general counsel about why we went about taking that route. Very well. Would you get back to us after you speak with them? I, that, that'd be very interesting uh, for us to know. Over the past several years, ransomware attacks have become more frequent and consequential. Did Colonial Pipeline have a ransomware continuity of operations plan to ensure that operations could continue in the event of a network disruption? Representative, thank you for asking that question. We have what we call an emergency response process. We use it for every threat that we identify 
throughout our pipeline system. So in this particular case, it was a cyber threat, came through our control room in the form of a ransomware note. We identified it, we contained it by shutting down the pipeline system, and then obviously we went on to the process of remediating and restoring our operation back into service as quickly and safely as we possibly could. We that also was, that's part of your planning. My, my, my next question is, but with that consideration in mind, is ransom part of that planning that you do? Well, thank you for that question. Of course, ransom is is part of the threat. So the answer to that question would be yes. Any any each 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 threat is unique, right? And and not all of them obviously come from the standpoint of a criminal element. It could be something that we see in one of our yards that's not a safe event that we want to we want to identify and contain and, and, and figure out how to remediate. So ransomware as, as part of our emergency response process is just another variable that we would deal with. Very well. Last week, Deputy National Security Advisor Ann Neuberger circulated a memo to corporate leaders urging them to take immediate action to defend against ransomware and mitigate the impacts of an attack. It recommends practices like backing up data, patch management, developing and testing incident response plans, working with uh, penetration testers and network segmentation, among other things. Before this incident, to what degree had Colonial backed up this critical data and systems, and did you keep backups offline? Great question, Representative. In fact, if you if you look how quickly we brought our system back on and our response, a good portion of that was a result of the fact that we wound up having very quality backup systems. And as I understand, and as I've learned a lot over the course of the last month, that's not always the case, which is why you want to make as many options available to you uh, when you see that threat, you contain that threat, and you start to remediate. But in our case, uh, we apparently had some very quality backup systems that allowed us to bring the pipeline on sooner than later. So my next question is, when uh, before this incident, when was the last time you tested your incident response plan, and what corrective actions did you take afterward? The incident response process is part of our DNA. We do tabletop exercises. Uh, if you talk about it from a physical standpoint, we work with local law enforcement and regions throughout the U.S. on an annual basis to, to prepare for emergencies that might take place across oh, our pipeline sir, do you system. Do you recall what the, when the last time was, or is that something your CIO would, would have to answer? Representative, again, ours is an emergency response process, so it might not even have been a cyber issue uh, 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 tabletop type exercise. It could have been any number of things like a pipeline physical attack and things like that. I'll be glad to share those dates with you. We do it continually. Again, it's part of our DNA as a safe organization. And I'm sure having uh, experienced this uh, incident, uh, there will be a closer uh, uh, look at the, the, the cybersecurity uh, concerns uh, of your of your organization. And, and let me just say that I think this is certainly a case study for cyber hygiene because it was through uh, an unsecure password that uh, the nation's largest pipeline was disrupted. And I want that to be a lesson to everyone who's listening to this hearing that we must, must do better with our cyber hygiene. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I thank you, Mr. Blunt, for your candor and, and your participation today. So, you know, ladies, time has expired. Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Miller-Meeks for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Thompson, and thank you, Ranking Member Katko and our witnesses today. Um, cyber attacks are certainly becoming more and more commonplace in the ever evolving digital age. Uh, in fact, we've had those to our local governments here in Iowa, and I have a JBS meat processing plant in my congressional district, as we know, uh, was recently involved from public schools and local libraries to critical infrastructure companies like Colonial Pipeline. No one is immune and all require prevention tools. Uh, systemically important companies such as Colonial uh, should be particularly wary of attack as you indicated that you were due to the unique source of the risk uh, that you represent. You mentioned yesterday, uh, Mr. Blunt, that uh, ransomware was uh, not mentioned in your cyber incident response plan. And so I have two questions. 
Um, due to the high risk of attack, um, have you given consideration to the risk of ransomware affecting your company? And what resiliency do you have in place to digitally communicate with the Internet of Things um, devices and um, OT or operational technology industrial controls that would protect your enterprise from future attacks knowing that they're coming? And this is also to help other com companies as well. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. And let me try to try to address them because I think you had a couple of those a uh, couple questions embedded in there. You know, certainly uh, as the investigation goes on and, and we when we continue to allow Mandy to do what they're, they've been brought in to do, we see no indications of compromise in the OT system. And, and I was asked that question earlier as to, well, then why did you shut down the system? And, and the response to that would be if you even think there's a one percent chance that that criminal got into your OT system that can potentially take over control of, of a 5,500 mile pipeline moving 100 million gallons a day, then you shut that pipeline down. And that's what we did that morning. We used our stop work authority. That control room employee made the right decision and, and shut the pipeline down. And I'm very proud of what he did there because it helped protect all of us, not only as uh, United States citizens, but also potentially protected the environment and the communities in which we serve. Now, I think you had one other question embedded in there. <laughs> Who is, uh, had you given consideration to ransomware? You know, when we look at, you know, our response, I'm, I'm very pleased with our response. When we look at our emergency response process, uh, certainly there won't be a definitive way to handle ransom in the future because I think each case is unique. And in this case, obviously it was the concern that we really had no vision into our IT or OT systems to understand the degree of corruption in encryption and it really took us days even with the help of a world-class expert by mandy to get there so again that's why that decision was made so again i think for operators it's it's probably better not to have a strict policy because you may need that option and there are a lot of a lot of entities in some cases like hospitals that that would be their only option potentially to pay the ransom and again i'm not i'm not saying that's a morally right or wrong uh decision but it may be a decision you have to make like I did that day, which was extremely difficult. So, uh, thank you. And and certainly we know, uh, I don't disagree with Representatives McCall or Slotkin that, uh, you know, we need to punish bad actors. And in this case, uh, uh, there, there could be uh, a state or country entities involved. Uh, and even though the OT system was not involved in this instance, um, we know that OT systems with access to the internet and emerging 5G technology bring further digital problems and opportunities for bad actors. And Mr. Carmichael, are there other technologies, um, i.e. mobile high frequency technologies that are safer, um, not on the internet and more cost effective that um, perhaps we should be recommending to companies that are uh, critical points of our infrastructure? between the IT yep. environments and the OT environments. And so we would um, you know, continue to encourage organizations to not only segment their operational technology environments, but uh, continue to get better visibility into the assets that exist within the operational technology environment and mitigate some of the risks associated with vulnerabilities that exist out there. And thank you so much. And certainly I think uh, both of you have emphasized the need to have a single a source point for reference uh, to uh, interact with the federal government, some things we need to work on. And is there a regulation that either of you think that uh, Congress should enact uh, for companies uh, for transparency, for immediate reporting, uh, and, uh, you know, to um, before negotiating uh, to pay ransom? And I'm, I'm running out of time, so thank you, Chair Thompson, if they could answer the question, and I'll yield back. Either one of the witnesses can answer the question. Re Representative, I, I would say that I think the new TSA standards are a great start on the part of the government. Uh, you know, the timely reporting, the 12 hour reporting, I think that's extremely valuable. Generally, it's time to expire. Uh, gentleman recognizes Mr. Correa for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again, for this most important hearing. I uh, can't think of any issue that's more important to our country, to our nation, to our society than cybersecurity. And gentlemen, thank you for being here today with us. Um, as I listen to your testimony, uh, uh, 
Mr. Blount, I'm reminded of a case I had here in my district about a year ago, just a local tax preparer with about 4,000 clients one day calls me and says, I've got a problem, Lou. And I said, what is it? It sounded just like a colonial uh, pipeline, you know, the good old days, which is small scale. This guy had his 4,000 customers essentially held hostage and he, uh, he was in trouble. And now we have colonial that shows that this is not something random and it's going to continue to get worse. So my question is really to Mr. Carmichael, if you can kind of pull back and envision a situation that we've had his I believe the gentleman is having uh, some technical difficulties. Uh, while Mr. Correa is getting uh, corrected, Ms. Hossbarger, we will recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Katko and the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Blount, I, you know, I. I feel for you being in front of Congress, uh, going in front of the Senate, now in front of us, uh, private companies, a lot of them don't even report that they have been ransomed in a lot of ways. And I've talked to companies in my district, first district of Tennessee, and they don't do it because they don't want their customer, customer base to feel that they're vulnerable or that they can't protect their, their information. The stock value goes down or the fact that they might be hauled in front of Congress those things would prohibit a lot of co companies from even even telling us that they've they've been hacked basically um let me ask you a simple question did you have confidence that the government if you reported a cyber breach that the government could help you with that breach before this ever happened Uh, thank you for that question that's that's an interesting question i've not heard that one in the last two days so so thank you I, well, that's I, just a, a straight up yes or no. Uh, well, you know, we have a 57 listen, year I history. Came from the private sector to the public sector. So I understand exactly what, how you feel right now. Yes, ma'am. Well, we have a 57 year history of dealing with the American government, both on a regulated side as well as the other entities that we have relationships with. So never in my mind did I think that one, I would have to make those calls. Uh, but but when I was making them and or my team was making them because it was an all hands effort that day, we knew that if if there was uh, things that we needed done, that they would get done. And we saw that. And I'll just give you one example because I don't want to eat up your time. Uh, we knew that trucks would have to be able to move fuel and we knew that drivers have limited number of hours. And we know currently in our COVID environment, there isn't, aren't as many truck drivers. So, again, reaching out early allowed some uh, regulation to be waived, which helped, you know, to some degree, get fuel into the market. Absolutely. Uh, you put in your testimony that you'd recommend designating a single point of contact uh, to coordinate these federal responses to, to types of events just like this. Uh, I guess, you know, that's, in other words, you're recommending establishing reciprocity across these federal agencies. Who did you, uh, when all this happened within that first 24, 48 hours, what agency did you primarily work with? Yeah, just just to give you some context, Representative, I, I want to give you a list because you weren't on the call earlier, but we contacted within 24 hours the White House, the NSC, the DOE, FEMSA, FERC, DHS, CISA with the FBI, EIA. And, and if yeah, you yeah. think about that, if we had to make uh, daily calls or intraday calls with each one of those throughout the restoration process, we probably would have come on a whole lot later. So we were fortunate in that in this particular case, the White House designated the DOE is our conduit mm -hmm. for everybody but the FBI. The FBI and CISA kind of handled the investigative side, and then DOE was our conduit to all the other entities that I named. That was extremely valuable to us. Uh, I'm not stating that one entity over the other should have that role, but I think if you look at the 24-7 um, effort that, that my team had to make, we needed that ability to communicate in this case, through DOE, about what was going on in the market, what we were doing to restore our IT systems, while we also had same conversations with the FBI, giving them data and evidence and things like that that we were finding as Mandiant went about doing what they needed to do throughout the course of the beginning of the event. 
Fantastic. I see where you recommended two to be adequately staffed, um, have adequate resources, and, and I totally agree with every bit of that. Um, Mr. Carmichael, uh, you explained in your testimony the definition of operational technology and industrial control systems, and you state that there are relatively fewer disclosed intrusions of OT environments as compared to the IT environments. And, and what my question is, is why do you think that is? Yeah, uh, Congresswoman, I think one of the reasons for that is because there are probably fewer intrusions into operational technology environments given the general segmentation that exists between IT environments and operational technology environments. I also think that many of the threat actors out there that conduct intrusions, while they might be very skilled from an IT intrusion perspective, many of them don't actually know um, and they're not familiar with the operational technology vendors and, and other infrastructure that exists within those environments. So they may not actually even know how to um, conduct um, substantial intrusions. But with that said, although there are fewer publicly reported incidents, the incidents that have been reported are quite substantial. When you think about a power outage in a, in a certain part of a country or potentially um, the modification of software that controls safety control systems uh, at a, um, a, chem a petrochemical facility in the Middle East, obviously the consequences are quite substantial. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and I yield back. Yeah, Time has expired. Chair recognizes again the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Gentleman needs to unmute. I can you hear me now? We got you now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I was just to uh, expose these bad guys when I got cut off. I guess uh, that's the way technology works, Mr. Carmichael. My question to you, sir. If you had a moment to pull back and look at the big picture, what should we be doing now to prepare for the next five years in terms of defending our system? Defense, offense, uh, what is it, what would your top two or three things that you would ask us to do on your wish list to make sure that we're better prepared for these attacks moving forward? Con Congressman, uh, unfortunately, we are dealing with cyber intrusions every single day. And what occurred over the past few months, it's been happening for the past several years. And so I think we all need to come together from both a government perspective, commercial organizations, as well as the security community to not only help organizations better defend themselves, but we'd certainly look for help from the government to uh, create some uh, repercussions to the threat actors that are conducting these intrusions. And so we'd certainly like to see uh, individuals uh, become identified that are conducting intrusions. We'd love to see arrests to the extent that's possible. We'd love to see uh, sanctions. We'd love to see indictments where it's possible. Um, we certainly would like um, government support to, to come in more from an offensive perspective and help disrupt some of the operations that these criminals uh, can continue to conduct in. And so uh, I, I do believe that we all need to come together and not only- Let me ask you, Mr. Carmichael, if I may interrupt you my couple of minutes that I have left. Please. What about us here? You're talking about the offense, but what about us here at home what can we do to better coordinate the private and public sector? We keep hearing this issue of, you know, hygiene, uh, cyber hygiene, and the fact that not everybody seems to buy into the threats that are out there and people are just not doing the right thing. How do we get the private sector to better coordinate with us and make sure they do the right thing? Yeah, uh, maybe two things. One, I'd certainly encourage organizations to conduct red team exercises or ethical hacks against their environment to test their defenses, to test their controls. I think a lot of organizations are under the assumption that they have all these security hygiene things in place, but unless you actually test your defenses, it's sometimes hard to identify when those defenses and those controls don't exist. Um, we also want to continue to, um, uh, to encourage organizations to share information about active threats. And again, we talked about this before, but we'd certainly love for uh, CISA to get more information about active intrusions, and we'd love for them to be able to disseminate that information as quickly do you as think they can. The, do you think the private sector right now, on a voluntary basis, is doing enough in terms of sharing their information with CISA when it comes to intrusions? Uh, I think it depends on the organization. Some certainly are, others may not be. But I, you know, one thing I'd love to commend uh, Colonial Pipeline on is uh, very shortly after their incident, 
Um, we had talked to them about publishing information about the dark side network and some of the indicators of compromise that they use and a description of the techniques that they use to not just um, um, help the, uh, the government, but also help other organizations that are trying to defend themselves. And so, you know, we are trying to do our part as well to get information out um, to help the community defend themselves. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank uh, Colonial Pipeline for their work and their cooperation federal government. I just hope there are some lessons learned here and that we can apply them and, and uh, distribute them uh, on a national basis to make sure we're all working. Uh, your, Mr. Carmackel, your words, uh, sharing and working together in a coordinated fashion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentlemen, yields back. Uh, chair recognizes uh, young lady from Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many of my questions have been asked and answered and asked again, but I would like to expand on uh, what was just discussed about better coordination here between public and private and among the different agencies uh, with throughout the country. We have to realize that this is an international problem. Not only are, is the enemy international, but uh, some of our friends are subject to the same kind of attacks. That's especially true among our NATO allies. They are uh, probably experiencing some similar kinds of things being hacked from people in Russia. So I wonder what we are doing or what we could be doing to better develop best practices or share information with our, our international allies and companies abroad. Either, either anybody? Uh, Congresswoman, uh, that, that's a great point, and I certainly want to recognize that uh, there are cyber threats that occur in, all over the world. In fact, when you look at um, you know, the geopolitical climate, I mean, you, you look at certain countries that are considered to be um, hot zones for cyber attacks. Ukraine certainly one of them. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is another one of them. And a lot of times we see intrusion activity occurring in um, that part of the world. Um, sometimes before that occur in the United States, um, possibly for um, you know for a number of different reasons, and I think uh, it certainly helps to, to share information uh, with the community, the broader community, um, to to apply some of the learnings that have occurred in, in with respect to some of the intrusions in Ukraine and um, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, for example, I mentioned that uh, there were uh, operational technology security incidents in both Ukraine and Saudi Arabia, and there are learnings that we've all been able to gather from that and make um, you know, and, and apply them within the United States. And again, we certainly welcome collaboration. Well, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Young lady yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Clyde for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Ranking Member Katko for holding this very important hearing. Um, you know, Mr. Blount, uh, my district, Georgia 9, certainly felt the impact of the pipeline shutdown, and I saw many gas stations uh, with no fuel. But I certainly commend you and the Colonial Pipeline workers for um, how quickly they worked with both private assets and federal agencies to get the pipeline back up and running in as reasonably short uh, time as possible. I know the decisions that you made were very difficult, as a, uh, especially the decision about the ransom, and that you made them in the best interests of your customers and our country, and our country in mind. And personally, I appreciate that. Um, I also commend the Department of Justice and the FBI for recovering the $2.3 million in ransom that was paid. By the way, Mr. Um, Blount, uh, have they given you that money back yet? Senator, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I suspect we haven't seen those Bitcoins back yet, but that, that's the first question I've heard along those lines in the last two days as well. So thank you. Well, I just want to make sure you do get it back. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned your desire that our government put pressure on host countries. Now, having gone through this very difficult experience, do you have any thoughts on how we could do that and how our president could send a strong message to our adversaries? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. I, you know, from our standpoint as a private operator, we, you know, we don't play in the geopolitical scene, of course. 
Uh, the president has a lot of capability in that regard, and certainly that's what we we ask that he consider, the government consider putting pressure on these host countries that are allowing this to happen uh, behind their, their boundaries. Uh, but as far as our recommendations, it's really not our backyard. We just think it's necessary in order to, you know, thwart as many of these attempts and, and to eliminate as many of these criminals as we possibly can so that no one does have to make the critical decision that I made on May 7th and, and to, to work 24-7 like my employees did in, in the great state of Georgia to bring that pipeline system back on. Okay, so you just want to hear that he's doing it. Uh, I've got no problem with hearing that. Yes, sir. All right, great. Um, for Mr. Carmackle, um, I have a couple questions for you. Um, I have always believed that the best defense is a good offense, and I'm a big proponent of making the bad actors pay, especially those who extort others. Um, in all of your work, do you have any information that would lead you to believe the ransomware attacks on Colonial Pipeline and JBS Foods were foreign state sponsored? And and if Sorry. Uh, uh, Congressman, um, we do not have any information indicating that the attacks against both those organizations were directed by the Russian government. Well, not just the Russian government, but any other state. Um, um, Congressman, we do not have any direct evidence um, suggesting that. Okay. All right. Well, um, same question that I had for Mr. Blount. Um, how would... Uh, how do you think our government could do a better job of putting pressure on host countries? I think to basically root out and eliminate these criminals like dark side. How could we do that? I, I think you're on mute, from a, sir. From a diplomacy, uh, the Congressman, um, I certainly welcome a number of things. Um, from a diplomacy perspective um, and foreign policy perspective, I'd welcome um, any support that uh, our president and, and government can apply uh, to, to Russia and, and other neighboring countries that host uh, criminals. We certainly don't want that uh, um, you know, ransomware and disruptive attack to continue. Um, we, we'd certainly also welcome um, more of an offensive capability to disrupt some of the criminal operations. We've seen successes over the past few weeks and certainly in the past few months. We'd love to see continued support to make it more difficult for these criminals to conduct these operations. Okay, I'm sure the people in your company are very talented. Uh, would your company have the ability or desire to assist the government if offered the right rules of engagement? Um, we, uh, Congressman, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's uh, something that uh, I need to talk to my team about. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and um, I have uh, one more, and this is um, uh, for Mr. Blount. Uh, between CISA, the FBI, TSA, and other agencies, there's a wealth of information and helpful guidance that is pushed to all companies across the all sectors. Uh, has any of that guidance ever made it to your desk or to that of your CIOs? And um, were, and if the, if it did, were there any that you found specifically helpful? The event we we found all the resources available to us to be extremely helpful. Uh, you know those phone calls that we had every day with DOE. Uh, everybody on those phone calls was expressing support in, in offering to help to the extent that they could. And again, we saw a lot of that. We saw, you know, uh, regulatory things waived in order to move fuel quicker, move more fuel on, on the same truck and things like that. So again, uh, as I've said previously, I've got nothing but good things to say about the response from the federal government and all those entities that we dealt with over the course of those days and continue to deal with as you can, can expect. Okay, well, thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the general lady from New Jersey, Watson Coleman, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. There's been some confusion on the topic of TSA assessments. There are two types of TSA assessments. The Critical Facility Security Review, CFSR, which looks at the physical security and the Validated Architectural Design Review, which looks at cybersecurity. Mr. Blount, you said that Colonial never declined these assessments, but according to TSA, Colonial has repeatedly postponed participating in a CFSR since March 2020 and has repeatedly postponed participating in a VADR assessment since October 2020. Delaying these assessments for so long amounts to declining them, sir. 
I understand a DADR assessment is now planned for late July, but that a CFSR assessment will still has not been scheduled. Given Colonial's recent track record of stonewalling TSA's request for two separate types of pipeline security assessment, it raises serious questions about your company's perspective on regulation. Does Colonial have a policy regarding requests from its regulators? Who decides whether Colonial uh, cooperates or does not cooperate with a TSA security assessment? And to your knowledge, did any of those requests that have been declined by your company to TSA ever get to your desk? Question, because I, I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. I'm not aware uh, that we've ever denied TSA uh, or refused to TSA to, to do any assessments. We've had a longstanding great relationship with TSA. I will share with you that, that my CIO is extremely frustrated with this continual question that we've refused. Uh, the her contacts at TSA don't understand why the word refusal has been used. We have asked for some exceptions as related to COVID-19. We are not going to expose our control room personnel to outside people uh, prior to the large majority of the United States being vaccinated. And Mr. as far as Vadar. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I understand that uh, TSA to do one of the assessments virtually, and even that was declined. So I'm going to I'm going to say that I think that um, your perspective on your relationship with TSA is one thing. Their re their perspective on the relationship uh, from the information we're getting is something other than that. So do you think there's a value in having a written policy that says that Colonial will respond uh, to requests coming from a regulator such as TSA and that that um, policy could be forthcoming as early as July 1? Representative, with all due respect, we always respond to any regulatory agency where we're responsible to. Again, we, we have had a good working relationship with TSA. Next week, when I get back to the office, I will be calling the head of TSA to have a discussion regarding this word refusal. It's not consistent with the relationship that this company's had. Thank you. Um, let me ask you a totally different one. I look forward to hearing from you as to the advances moving forward with regard to the relationship and the mutual understanding between TSA and Colonial. I think TSA has a very important role in this space. I have a real quick question, I think. You paid $4 million for an encryption key, and then you said that it was insufficient. Can you tell us what where the insufficiencies existed uh, what was problematic, how you overcame those deficiencies to get things up online? Representative, great question. I'm not a technical person, so I, can, I couldn't explain deficiency as far as the tool. I know that all these tools are not perfect, but they, they have, I have been told that Mandiant has used the tool. So whether they've had to manipulate it in order to make it perfect, so to speak, that, that would be a great question for them. I don't have the technical expertise to, to then, define then, that further for you. Then in the little bit of time I have left, could I ask Mandy to respond to that question? Because I want to reiterate, you spent $4 million to get it. Other folks who are, are um, have a, a malware um, hacking, they need to understand that they could go on and pay the ransom and still not get what they need to get up and running again. So can I have uh, Mr. Carmichael respond to that for the remainder of my time? Uh, Congresswoman, um, the decryptor that was provided by the threat actor, it did work, it was effective. There were bugs in it certainly, but it didn't actually, it wasn't actually needed to be able to recover systems and data within the colonial pipeline environment. They leveraged their backup processes and their restoration processes to be able to effectively come back online. And so while the tool did work, it just wasn't needed at the time. Thank you. That begs the question then, since you they already had the, the capacity to get back up online, A, should they have ever paid, paid, paid the ransom, and B, should they have ever cut the supply of, um, of, of resources off to those who are waiting for it along the Northeast Corridor? Thank you, and I yield back. Young lady yields back. Chair, recognized gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Meyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to those who are uh, here today, our, our experts, Mr. Monk or, and Mr. Uh, McCormickle. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, Mr. Blount, I, I really appreciate you coming before this committee. I know this has obviously been been challenging and uh, Colonial Pipeline has been the focus, uh, just given the widespread economic impact that has been felt throughout the region. Um, but part of our committee's role here is to determine how we can make this federal engagement and critical infrastructure stakeholder relationship as efficient and effective as possible to prevent and also mitigate any other future attacks. And, and so I just wanted to say, I appreciate your willingness to talk to us on this end. I do not want this to be um, viewed or, or felt as um, as too much of a uh, an inquisition, but we obviously need to make sure that we're learning the right lessons from what happened. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that you were in contact with the FBI and CISA within hours of discovering the attack and that you stayed in contact throughout the process and you went through and prior questioning uh, what that timeline was like. Um, just as a brief yes or no from that experience, um, is it clear to you how the U.S. government shares information internally on cybersecurity? I, I would say the answer to that, uh, Congressman, is no. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's certainly an area where I think our federal government needs to clarify that, um, given the uh, vast array of actors um, on the governmental side at play here. And then you offered the recommendation of creating that single point of contact, but you know, with our with the colonial pipeline attack, we had DOE uh, leading the federal government's response. We had entities like CISA and TSA that had more explicit responsibilities that were obviously involved in that, and then obviously the FBI as well. So um, within the internal processes, we obviously need to work to streamline um, as best as we can. Uh, and I, I guess another uh, yes or no, um, would you support a mandatory reporting requirement to CISA and the FBI in the event of a, a cyber attack on an institution? Representative, I guess the way I look at that is, uh, you know, that's exactly what we did. So that's the right choice for Colonial. I, you know, I'd hate to say that I think that's the right choice for another party, but for us, that transparency is extremely important, and we would do it again just like we did it last time. No, no issues with that at all. No, and then again, uh, I think we've seen with the naming of of, um, of former attacks. I'm thinking Solar Winds comes to mind. Uh, the, the stigma. Uh, that's associated can create a set of incentives that cause um, companies to to hide that, to not report it, or to, to stay in the shadows, and how that can have a compounding effect uh, um, in terms of being able to identify, deal with the risks, and, and root it out. Um, and Mr. Carmichael, we we've spoken about this earlier, and um, and I want to strongly associate myself with the remarks of Mr. McCall. Uh, Ms. Miller Meeks and Ms. Slotkin on this front. Um, the asymmetric nature of this threat uh, and, and dealing with asymmetric threats as a nation state, as a superpower, is perennially challenging. Um, I am frustrated to no end that lawmakers and, and, and corporate executives and others um, in, in government and in the private sector in the United States are staying awake at night concerned about the cybersecurity threat. Meanwhile, the dark sides, uh, the advanced persistent threat actors overseas, um, especially those who are not officially supported by a nation state, but certainly offered safe harbor or otherwise um, not being, uh, not upholding any, any sort of rule of law, uh, those actors are not staying awake at night. Uh, they don't have the same fear that we have. Um, I, I firmly believe that the United States government needs to engage in this in a serious way. We need to have those actors understand the consequences before we have an incident that takes American lives. Um, we certainly saw widespread economic disruption with the colonial pipeline, um, but the, the asymmetry here is palpable and it's something that we need to work strongly to address, uh, and we need to be able to put that fear into those who seem who seek to attack the United States that they cannot operate with impunity, uh, that we will be the ones who knock, and that there will be consequences. Um, so I know that you, you've addressed that prior, but I just wanted to give you a, a brief moment to address any further thoughts you have on that offensive capability. Thank you. Um, Congressman, I certainly agree that uh, we, we need to make it more difficult 
for these threat actors to conduct their operations. Um, I, I'm really proud of some of the successes that we've had over the past few weeks and the past few months in um, government coming together with commercial organizations to disrupt some of the capabilities of threat actors. When you look back at um, what occurred back in October of uh, 2020 with respect to the acute threat to healthcare organizations, a lot of folks came together to um, help curb the ransomware problem that was occurring that uh, um, was directly impacting um, healthcare organizations. And you look at the um, disruption of the TrickBot um, network and the Emotet botnet, you know, there's, there's been a number of successes, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to go uh, to do more, to go more offensive. But I think we need to define what the rules of engagement are and what's accepted um, and what's acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, you're back. Thank you, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri for five minutes, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, let me first of all thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to introduce and uh, the committee passed uh, the, the Pipeline Security Act, uh, which uh, codifies TSA's Pipeline Security Division. And uh, it increases engagements between uh, pipeline uh, operators, TSA, and CISA. <clears throat> and as I said, the, the it was made, it, it uh, came out of the committee last month. But uh, Mr. Carmichael, uh, uh, you know, based on, on your experience working with critical uh, infrastructure owners and operators who uh, have experienced and even suffered from this uh, ransomware or other types, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of cyber attacks, do you have any observation about how the federal government can improve its response? Uh, and uh, better coordinate its efforts, uh, particularly for uh, private sector critical infrastructure such as pipelines. Give, give, give us what, what you think we ought to be doing. Um, um, Congressman, I, th I certainly think that we need to take the learnings from these attacks, these other intrusions, um, and perhaps some of the things that organizations thought they were doing well from a security perspective and share that uh, uh, with, with other organizations out there. I think it's a, uh, it's a missed opportunity if we, if we don't take these learnings from both an intrusion perspective and um, you know, security control failures perspective and, and share that with other organizations. Um, I certainly welcome other um, uh, more uh, red team exercises or penetration testing for organizations to again, to test the defenses um, and to maybe test some of their assumptions with respect to controls that they believe that they have. Do you feel vulnerable? Do you still, I mean, do you still feel like you're vulnerable? Uh, Congressman, unfortunately, we deal with cybersecurity incidents every single day. And as the days uh, progress, I, I feel more direct impact by some of these uh, intrusions. And I, and I do feel unless we actually come together and do something, um, we'll continue to feel this on a day-to-day -day basis from a personal perspective. Well, now the, the colonial attack, uh, you know, actually has uh, brought cybersecurity uh, to the front of the line in terms of uh, international uh, issues uh, and security issues. Uh, and and uh, but but this this uh, uh, impacts the pipeline sector uh, into uh, you know trying to figure out uh, you know what we can what what you can do <clears throat> and. Uh, other people in your same business are trying to figure out what what, they, what challenges they have and what they can do. Given FireEye uh, 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 Mandiant's role uh, as a leading cybersecurity provider, uh, you surely have a, a front row seat uh, in, into the, the, the vulnerabilities. Do, does FireEye have other clients in the, in the pipeline uh, space? If your experience, uh, in, in your experience, uh, uh, how would you generally describe cybersecurity preparedness in, uh, in, the, in your sector, in the pipeline sector? Uh, Congressman, we've got clients across all sectors, and I'll tell you the, the skills and sophistication and security maturity of those organizations certainly vary. Um, so it's sometimes hard to uh, 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 summarize a certain capability for a particular sector. Um, what, what I will say is that uh, anytime there is a major security incident that becomes public, um, organizations within the same sector, they try to take learnings from those organizations and they try to apply some of the best practices and, and you know, some of the learnings from those organizations. And I'll, I'll, I'll certainly say that there are a number of organizations that are taking note right now and they're trying to do whatever they can to improve their security defenses. I think, unfortunately, a lot of organizations are in a similar position. I, I, was, I, I should have uh, added uh, my, 
I'm, I'm extremely concerned about the transportation sector, uh, you know, compared to other forms of, of critical infrastructure. Uh, I mean, how would you, uh, you know, generally assess the vulnerability, <clears throat> excuse me, of the transportation sector? Um, Congressman, I, I think that there are opportunities for transportation sector organizations to continue to improve their security posture um, and, and apply the learnings from this. Yeah, uh, okay. I, I yield back, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes a uh, gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Mr. Pluger. Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Katko. Uh, what a, uh, an opportunity to talk about something that's so important. Uh, Mr. Blount, Mr. Carmichael, uh, thank you for your expertise here. I've got one question for each of you. I'll start with Mr. Blount. Um, the district I represent includes the Permian Basin. We produce 40% of the country's oil. Uh, energy security is national security. I'm very worried about uh, making sure that we ensure that we protect this, this industry that, that heats our homes, uh, runs our businesses, uh, obviously lets our economy continue to flourish. So, you know, beyond the ones and the zeros, Mr. Blount, what, what do you see as uh, another aspect of resiliency? Um, because it's obvious that the Colonial Pipeline is a uh, a, a very significant piece of critical infrastructure for our country. Um, and uh, and I hope that we can take these lessons and truly learn them and apply them. So what other, other types of resiliency can we uh, can we look to in this sector, in this industry? Probably. No, I've spent 35 years of my career in, in Houston, Texas, and I can tell you that uh, though I haven't really had the opportunity to return a lot of phone calls here in the last month, that's a major concern on the part of all the energy sector right now. And I think a lot of what we talked about today with regard to the private public partnership is extremely important. I think Mandy and Anna a really valuable equation today, which is the security sector has a lot to add in that conversation. So it's a three way partnership and we need to find a way to communicate all the learnings that we take away from the colonial <laughs> incident and combine that with with this the amazing amount of, of other incidents that have happened that one, we. We, we aren't aware of that, that Mandy it might be uh, and, and learn from those to create the resiliency we need to compete against a very sophisticated criminal element that continues to get more sophisticated. That's a great question. Well, thank, thank you for what you do, for what Colonial does to provide the energy that the specifically East Coast needs, um, such an important piece of our infrastructure. Um, and, and I think we all need to look at it uh, and continue to diversify in this country um, when, it, when it comes to uh, providing those sources uh, of gasoline and, uh, and natural gas and, uh, and, and other uh, fuels to the, to the, uh, the coastlines. Um, uh, for Mr. Carmichael, uh, I, I also represent uh, Angela State University, a minority serving institution, Hispanic serving institution in the middle of rural America. It is a cyber center of excellence. I'm very interested in understanding what we can do at the university level to ensure that we're building the next generation of cyber experts that can come to your company uh, at FireEye. I appreciate what you do and can go throughout the rest of the United States, um, quite frankly, uh, to bolster against the threat that we're talking about today. Uh, can you specifically talk about uh, at the university level what we should be doing uh, to, to help that uh, effort? Need for um, educating more um, university students and, and individuals at a, a much younger level about cybersecurity. You know, there's a, a desperate need for more cybersecurity professionals out there and, and really anything that we could do to um, create more cybersecurity curriculum within universities and encourage more um, uh, 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 young individuals to take on careers in cybersecurity would uh, certainly help us improve and the, the defense and overall security posture uh, of the nation. Uh, at FireEye and Mandiant, we do a number of things with respect to recruiting talent from universities. We do a lot of presentations at universities. We try to inspire um, young professionals and uh, students to, to become cybersecurity professionals once they graduate from college. So I really do appreciate the question. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to continue to push on this because uh, in rural America, we need to make sure that our folks understand this is an option for them. This is a job that they can do. And they you know, whether it's farming, ranching, or the oil and gas sector, or any other uh, sector in the United States, we need people who understand this, and it needs to start earlier and earlier. I think a whole of government approach uh, is, is called for. And again, I'm going to reiterate in my last uh, 45 seconds here that energy security is national security. Our country exports 
more than we import. We are dominant in the world. The countries that are buffered up against Russia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, the Ukraine, Poland, and others, their leaders wake up every single day and they are trying to figure out how to deliver energy to their citizens. And we in the United States are blessed with uh, a bountiful source of energy. The winter storm in Texas is another example um, of, of just how fragile our infrastructure can be. And so uh, as, as part of the Homeland Security Committee, I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to look at the cyber aspects uh, of defense and to make sure that any other vulnerability uh, is considered that we can continue to provide affordable, reliable energy uh, for the country. With that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for this and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, chair recognizes the old lady from Florida, uh, Ms. Demons, for five minutes. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you as well to our ranking member and also to our witnesses. Uh, thank you for uh, your testimony today. We certainly cannot get to the point where we need to without you and your participation. Um, you know, this this hearing is extremely timely for a lot of reasons, but we've known for for decades now that the new weapon of choice, certainly for the criminal element, uh, is a cyber attack. I think the question is, what are we uh, willing to do about it um, to certainly prevent further attacks in the future? Mr. Blunt, I wanna thank you so much for your candor earlier. I, as we were talking about, you know, the timeline, the chairman started out with that, and I was particularly interested in the timeline of notification um, and the decision to pay the ransom. You very clearly said that, um, you know, you made that decision to pay uh, the ransom and keep it confidential, um, you know, because of operational security. Uh, concerns. And so while we certainly appreciate that, I just want to make sure I understand um, in terms of you, you notify the FBI, which certainly I'm glad you did that in a timely manner because you were a victim, certainly of an attack. But I, I don't believe you consulted with the FBI before you made the decision to pay the ransom. And if that is correct, since it is an investigation and certainly getting direction from law enforcement is so very important, if that is correct, why didn't you make the decision to consult with the FBI, uh, the lead investigatory agency, if you will, in a sense, before agreeing to pay the ransom? Representative, thank you so much for asking that particular question. Um, that is true that that uh, I made the decision to pay the ransom. Uh, and it is true that I we called the FBI immediately uh, on May 7th to report what we saw as an intrusion into our system. We've been extremely cooperative with, with the FBI uh, throughout the process and including uh, on Sunday, that Sunday, sharing with them information about the digital wallet. Uh, as far as actually going to them and having a conversation about we're going to pay the ransom, it's very clear if you go to their website, as you probably know, uh, that they don't encourage that. So unfortunately, the decision winds up on the part of the private industry player to make that decision, which, of course, I, I've taken all the accountability for doing that. But again, extremely yeah. cooperative with them. And, and then from an operational security standpoint, we needed to keep the, the conversation with the perpetrator going in order to preserve that optionality of getting the de-encryption tool and anything else we might need in those early days before we even understood whether our backup systems could be de-encrypted on our own and actually help us bring that pipeline back on by Wednesday, starting Wednesday of that following week. Mr. Blunt, thank you so much for that. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, the FBI does not encourage that. And there certainly is a reason for that. It obviously has turned out uh, better than it could have. But still, I, I, I'm still just trying to understand because I'm thinking about, you know, one of the questions that was asked earlier is, you know, how are you working with other um, organizations, other corporations to make sure that they aren't attacked, you know, lessons learned from your attack. And I'm just a little curious about why you chose to not take um, the recommendation of the FBI in this particular case. You ultimately made the decision anyway, and I think you knew you could always do that. But why did you decide not to take the uh, recommendation of the FBI uh, in the first place in this particular attack? Oh, th thank you again for, for asking that question. I, I don't, the, the FBI never recommended that we not pay. We know that their guidelines suggest that they don't encourage you to pay. 
And again, when you're responsible right. for moving 100 million gallons of fuel into the market every day and suddenly you, that stops and you consider the potential dire consequences that I prefer not to get into publicly of not being able to bring that pipeline on as quickly and safely as we did. Think about what we would look like if we had not brought that pipeline on until the following weekend. Right, we serve a lot of airports. We obviously we serve a lot of critical services like ambulances and things like that with those fuels. So in those early hours of the morning, not knowing how quickly we could de-encrypt our own uh, own uh, servers and things like that on our own, that was an option I had to avail myself of. And again, I, Mr. Blunt, I didn't thank you so much. Thank yes, you so much for that. And I just need to get this last question in, and you, then you can answer. Um, you know, it's been said, and I'm a former law enforcement officer, and I've heard it um, said and kind of witnessed it that uh, the private sector is not the best partners in terms of cooperating uh, with uh, investigations involving law enforcement in situations like this. Um, what role would you say Colonial played uh, in in the attack that occurred? Um, and 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 how do you learn from that moving forward? In other words, what could you have done better to prevent this attack? Again, thank you, thank you for that question, Congresswoman. I think that you know, if you look in hindsight, we responded extremely well to, to what happened to us. You know, we've heard the word out of the DOJ this week that we were an innocent victim. We continue to invest in IT and, and cyber and have and have taken that seriously because we do understand the importance of of our pipeline system when it comes to the American security and, and lifestyle and growth of the country, right? In, in hindsight, I, I am extremely pleased with the transparency we've exhibited as a corporation, but of course it's not a surprise to me because that's that's the way I am and that's the way this company has been. We're, we're very straightforward. We're gonna tell you what's going on. Uh, we're gonna share information along the way. And you've seen a lot of press releases by me in the last month, not anything I really like to do, but I want to share the information as it becomes available, including, you know, the statement we made about the VPN and the issue that we have with the VPN. A lot of companies wouldn't have admitted to that, right? They would have just moved on, especially private companies. But again, our role here is critical to the nation, and we're going to be very clear about what happened to us so that it doesn't happen to someone else in the future. Thank you, Mr. Blunt. So, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes. The vice chair of the full committee, gentleman from New York, Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first question is directed toward Mr. Carmichael. Um, how would you rate the cybersecurity preparedness of the pipeline sector? Give me a letter grade. Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, again, so it's hard to make an assessment right now, but I'd say yeah, there's certainly um, opportunities for improvement. Do you feel like it's satisfactory? I, I do believe that we have to continue to improve the security of the industry of the sector. Do you advise your clients to pay a ransom? Uh, look, um, Congressman, we don't um, tell our clients to pay or not to pay, but we do encourage them to have a very robust conversation about whether or not a payment should be made. And we look at a number of different criteria, such as does a threat actor still have access to the environment? Could they potentially escalate their attacks? Have they stolen data from the, the organization? What's the actual impact to per perhaps human lives or environmental conditions, things like that. So we encourage our clients to have a robust conversation, but we don't tell them one way or the other. It's up to them to make the decision to do it. Mr. Blunt, what was the overall cost of the ransomware attack? And by cost, I'm referring not only to the ransom, but also the cost of disrupted service, the loss of revenue. Or Representative, uh, we haven't been focused on the cost of the incident. We've been focused on the remediation of what took place. We were very focused on bringing the pipeline back as quickly as we could to help support the economy in the United States. Cost doesn't play into this. It's the, the reaction to containing the threat, remediating and restoring the pipeline system. The, the cost will play out over the next couple of weeks. You have no cost at the moment. Excuse me, I didn't hear that. There was some interference. Do you have no cost estimate at the moment? Hasn't been our focus, Representative. Yes, sir. And the decision to shut down the pipeline, the decision to pay the ransom, um, was that your decision? Or was it made based on your decision? Was it made pursuant to a company policy? 
representative at Colonial, we have what is called stop work authority. It exists in a lot of companies around the world, certainly pipeline companies. Any employee that sees a risk and a threat has, has the ability to shut down the pipeline system. That's what occurred that morning. A controller saw the threat come in the form of the ransomware, communicated it to his supervisor, and the supervisor made the call to shut the pipeline down. Absolute right move to make. If the OT system had been compromised, uh, you potentially had a foreign actor having access to a critical U.S. infrastructure. Absolutely right. So my question is, if your operational systems were compromised, what would happen in the nightmare scenarios that keep you up at night? Representative, that's, that's every operator's worst case nightmare is having a, a third party criminal element come into their system and take over their operation. And we've seen that in some recent events. Uh, some waterworks that I heard where they had the ability to change the chemical content of the water and things like that. Asking in, in your case, what is the nightmare scenario that keeps you up a bit? What specifically would happen? Representative, I, I can't hear you. You're, you're, there's some corruption in the system. I'm asking if, 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 if your system had been compromised, your operational system, what would happen in the worst case scenario that you showed up at? <laughs> Uh, representative, with all due respect, I don't think you want to play that out in a foreign public right now, right? I think you could have some very dire consequences. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I hate to interrupt, but someone, someone has their uh, microphone on. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, I think they heard you, and perhaps they, they muted themselves. <laughs> Can I proceed or? Excuse me, Mr. Torres. Excuse me. Can I, okay, thank you. What sorts of issues should TSA consider addressing in the requirements um, with respect to security directive? Are there specific statutory or regulatory reforms you believe would help prevent critical infrastructure? Uh, uh, Mr. Excuse me, just a minute. We're really having some interference, uh, and I'm not certain exactly what it is. Um, let me try one more time, uh, Mr. Torres. Uh, it might have been a gentleman from New York. <laughs> Um, that while Ms. Torres, we're gonna let you try one more time. Can you hear me clearly or much clearer? Okay, uh, Mr. Blunt, did, did Colonial make the ransom payment or did an insurance provider do so on your behalf? A third party negotiator made that payment, and my understanding is that. The, a company can seek a tax deduction for a ransom payment. Does your company intend to seek a tax deduction for the ransom payment? Senator, great question. I have no idea about that. I'm not aware of that at all. Um, what sorts of issues should TSA consider uh, addressing and follow on requirements beyond this security directive? Are there specific statutory or regulatory reforms you believe would help prevent shutdowns of critical infrastructure from occurring in the future? Representative, I think anything any governmental entity can do in the form of communication and, and what they have available and, and how they can collaborate with uh, private uh, uh, industry, including critical infrastructure, would be extremely important. And Mr. Chair, if I can ask one more question or? One more question. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, TSA's new security directive does require pipeline operators to assess their own compliance with TSA guidance and report back to TSA and CISA. However, it does not require pipeline operators to submit to inspections conducted by TSA itself. Would you support such a requirement? And that will be my final question. Great question, Representative. We, we have cooperated with TSA in the past and there's no reason why we wouldn't cooperate with them now or in the future. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, let me thank the witnesses for their testimony today. There are two items I'd like to make sure we get additional clarification on. Uh, Mr. Blount, 
uh, a number of members have questioned how much the FBI actually knew about the ransom payment. And uh, could you uh, indicate whether or not they had any involvement uh, with the company on advising them one way or the other on the payment? Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to clarify that. No, they were not involved in, in that decision, nor were they consulted about that decision. As far as how much they knew, they are the FBI. They could have known a lot more than they learned from us, but we did not have those conversations. Well, no question about it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, second, uh, Mr. Carmichael said that you did not need the decryption tool to reopen the pipeline, but you said you paid the ransom so you could get the pipeline back online. So which is it? Mr. Chairman, it's it's actually both, and I and I would suggest that Mr. Carmichael chime in, Carmichael chime in on this after I finish. When when you are there in the early hours of having your system and, and your servers and computers encrypted, you don't know what you have in front of you. You don't know how good your backup systems are. And what I've learned over the course of the last month is a lot of companies have backup systems that don't help them at the end of the day. So again, not knowing what the answer to that was for days, whether we could use our backup systems to restore the Colonial Pipeline system back to service or not, we had to avail ourselves of any and every option that we had, one of which was the de-encryption tool. So therefore the ransom payment was made in order to get the tool. The tool was then brought in house, Mandiant had the tool, and while Mandiant was also working with the tool, they were working with our backup systems, which in this case allowed us to bring the pipeline system back on. If our backup systems had been corrupted and were never capable of being used, there was the potential that we would have to rebuild the entire system, in which could have taken us a lot longer than bringing the pipeline back on before Wednesday of the following week. Again, critical, critical, dire consequences could have come out of that. So again, I availed myself of an option that in hindsight, we didn't necessarily need but we wouldn't have known it for days, which would have just delayed our ability to start the system back up and bring 100 million gallons of fuel back into our into our country. Thank you very much. Mr. Carmichael, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I agree with Mr. Blount um, that, you know, in the early days, there were a lot that was unknown and um, and um, yeah, Mr. Blount wanted to um, have any option available to, to recover and to be able to turn the pipeline back on. So um, I, I, I do believe that, uh, um, that there were a number of options and um, you know, having those options available um, certainly helped with the um, more expedited recovery of uh, the pipeline. Uh, thank you very much. And let me thank the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their questions. Members of the committee may have additional questions for the witnesses. And we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. The chair reminds members that the committee record will remain open for 10 business days. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.